So these are the doors that Thank you all for attending today's Sanitation and Solid Waste Committee hearing on intro 157. My name is Antonio Reynoso and I chair this committee. I want to take a moment before we begin to speak about history and justice. Um, for decades, my community, a low income community of color, has suffered from a long list of environmental injustices, including the BQE being built right through the middle of our neighborhood, operation of toxic industrial uses, and the reason we are here today the siting of 12 waste transfer stations in my district. My district has 38% of the city's waste capacity, and we deal with the consequences on a daily basis. Every day, thousands of trucks fly through our neighborhood, creating, creating hazardous conditions for pedestrians and bikers while spewing polluting toxins into our air. My district suffers from some of the highest asthma rates in the city, with Woodhull Hospital taking in the most emergency asthma cases of any health and hospitals facility in the city of New York. 
As a representative for this district, I cannot stand idly by while my folks suffer. I cannot stand by while the rest of the city uses Williamsburg, the South Bronx, and Southeast Queens as a dumping ground. Councilmember Levin and I introduced this, this bill last session with the goal of alleviating the burden of these communities. After introducing this bill, we met the fierce opposition from the industry, which is not a surprising, which is not surprising considering the track record of these companies. Private sanitation is one of the least regulated sectors in the entire city. Their trucks are old and polluting. Safety standards are almost non-existent. Wage theft is common and trucks travel in the most inefficient way, creating unsafe conditions on our roads and poisoning our air. Not even two weeks ago, a private sanitation truck being operated by a drunk driver plowed through nine cars in Borough Park. A crash like this is not an unusual event in the private in sanitation industry. I want to be clear, as we work through this bill, I met with the industry more than I met with the advocates. I hope they would recognize the negative impacts that they were having on local residents and work with me on addressing this issue. Instead, what we got was a full court press from the industry to undermine our efforts to bring about basic fairness to our constituents. I was repeatedly threatened by the industry that they would not improve conditions until I withdrew my legislation. And now, almost five years into this, these companies have done nothing to clean up their act. In fact, things have gotten worse. As traffic fatalities in the city decreased overall, we have seen crashes among the top 20 carters nearly double since 2014. There have also been no improvement in recycling rates, even as the city has expanded recycling requirements for commercial businesses. This is true even amongst, amongst the folks that we consider to be the good players, such as Action Carting, whose recycling rates at the Bronx facility decreased 23% between 2016 and 2017. The industry has acted in bad faith through this entire process, and I am pleased that we are moving forward with legislation that will finally curtail some of the injustices our communities have been subjected to. Justice is what we are talking about here. No community wants a transfer facility in their neighborhood, but no one wants to stop producing trash either. How can someone look at a system where three low-income communities of color shoulder the burden of two-thirds of the city's waste processing capacity and say that it's fair? Make no mistake, when folks say they don't support this bill, what they are saying is they have no issue with dumping their trash on poor black and brown people. We cannot call ourselves a progressive city and continue to allow a system like this to exist. This bill is about people over profits. Industry interests and lobbying will play no role in the legislative process for this bill. I will not allow commercial sanitation companies to get rich by sacrificing the health and safety of minority communities in the city of New York. I wanna take a moment now to talk about what this bill does and does not do. I think education is extremely important and considering that the majority of the people in this room are people of color. There's been a lot of misinformation associated with this legislation, so please pay attention to the facts as I walk through them. Can we set the slide up? Hope everybody can see it. Intro, <laughs> second slide, thank you very much. As I mentioned, three communities, North Brooklyn, South Bronx, Southeast Queens, possess approximately two thirds of the city's waste capacity. Thousands of trucks roll through our neighborhoods on a daily basis where folks have to deal with dangerous pedestrian conditions as well as high levels of noise and air pollution. Next slide. Uh, current concentrations of private waste citywide. As you can see, between North Brooklyn, South Bronx, and Southeast Queens, the majority of the trash is run through three community districts. Out of 51, three community districts handle all that trash. The rest of the city of New York handles that portion of it. Next slide, please. Here we can see how businesses all across the city send their waste to North Brooklyn, where we have 38% of the city's waste capacity. 
Studies have shown that air quality in my community is 300 times worse on days when transfer stations are open. 300 times worse. The Bronx is not much better, with 22% of the city's waste capacity and trash coming from all five boroughs, leading to asthma rates that are eight times the national average. That means eight times more children, mostly of color from the Bronx, have asthma related to uh, pollution in these districts. Slide six. Southeast Queens is also overburdened, handling 4% of the city's waste from four different boroughs. Slide seven. This bill will begin to provide some relief to overburdened communities, cutting transfer station capacity in overburdened districts by 50% in North Brooklyn and 33% in the South Bronx and Southeast Queens. We've also built incentives into the bill to encourage recycling and exporting waste by rail, which would take additional trucks off the street. Finally, this bill would ensure that no other neighborhood becomes the next Williamsburg by placing 10% waste capacity caps on all districts in the city which means no district in the city of New York will ever see more than 10% of the city's trash in their neighborhood after this bill is passed. I want to take a moment to put the 10% cap in perspective. In 2017, a community would have needed to have a little over 5,000 tons of capacity to hit the cap. In 2017, my community has 20,000 tons of capacity, nearly four times the amount that would be allowable. So we're saying no community would take on 5,000 tons even though my community at this moment takes on 20,000 tons of trash. There have also been accusations that this bill will push trash to other communities. This is simply not true. The city has approximately 46,000 tons of waste processing capacity, of which about only 20,000 tons are used, which means less than half of the city's capacity is actually used. So there are permits for 46,000 tons. Of that 46,000 tons, which the city allows for us to use, we only use 20,000 tons, which means that the trash will not be pushed to other neighborhoods. We will simply be capping the ability for more trash to come into our neighborhoods. My district will still have an excess of about 4,000 tons of capacity after this bill is passed, which means even after that happens, we'll still be taking on 4,000 more tons of trash. The South Bronx will still have 2,000 tons of excess, so we're saying 6,000 tons of trash that it goes unused will still exist in the Bronx and in Queens. To be clear, Williamsburg will be processing a disproportionate share of the city's waste for the foreseeable future. We are simply asking for no more than we have now. Slide eight. Through the provisions outlined in this bill, we will also be able to promote quality facilities. We will be able to promote quality facilities. These facilities have uh, these facilities often have terrible working conditions and are poorly run. Just this past March, a five-alarm fire broke out at Royals facility in Queens, which shut down the Long Island Railroad and required nearly 200 firefighters and 24 hours to get under control. This legislation will provide opportunities for those transfer stations that recycle and use sustainable waste export methods. We want the good transfer stations to stay open. We want the good transfer stations to continue to provide jobs. The bad ones need to go. Slide nine. One of the most important aspects of the city's swamp plan or solid waste management plan, swamp is short, SWMP, solid waste management plan, was the commitment to open four marine transfer stations across the city. By doing so, the city could relieve some of the burden in these communities like mine, while also producing modern, up-to-date facilities that export waste by barge, which is less impactful on communities that long haul trucks used to used by most transfer stations. However, the city has already opened has already opened two of these MTSs, and we still we are still receiving the same amount of waste as we did prior to the opening of Queens 12. There's actually been a slight uptick in this throughput. While I fully support the MTSs, without them, the overburdened districts would be receiving even more waste. It is important to acknowledge that they will not fully accomplish the equity goal set forth in the swamp. Intro 157 is a long overdue step to bring environmental justice to the frontline communities. I look forward to hearing the testimony today from the administration, community advocates, and the industry. And I thank you for that time. Now we're gonna call on the Department of Sanitation for their testimony. Uh, Catherine Garcia, the Commissioner of Sanitation. Oh, and I'm sorry, can we let, I didn't see, we've been joined by Councilman Bahaim Deutsch, 
and Council Member Steve Levin. Council Member Steve Levin is a prime sponsor of the bill, so I want to allow him a few moments to speak on the bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, for the courtesy. I want to thank our chair. Uh, of Sanitation Councilmember Antonio Reynoso for convening today's hearing to discuss this much needed and long overdue piece of legislation. I also want to thank him uh, for his tireless commitment to waste equity in New York City and his tireless commitment to this piece of legislation. Uh, intro 157B would bring critical relief to communities impacted by the overconcentration of waste transfer stations. As the chair said, transfer stations in North Brooklyn, South Bronx, and Southeast Queens take on 64 percent of the city's entire waste processing capacity. In North Brooklyn alone, more than 2,000, or sorry, more than 200 diesel trucks travel through the streets every hour, and only 10 percent of the trucks meet the 2007 EPA emission standards as of 2016. Without new limits, North Brooklyn's capacity could go even higher uh, and allow for 2,000 more trucks per day on our streets. Um, as our chair mentioned, the environmental impact of overconcentration has had on our communities is truly devastating. Air quality in North Brooklyn is over 300 percent worse on days when transfer stations are open, disproportionately impacting marginalized communities. Rates of asthma are highest among Latino and black children in New York City at 9.8 percent and 6.9 percent, respectively. This is not a coincidence. This is decades of environmental injustice that need to be corrected. It is also not just our public health that is suffering. It is our neighborhood safety, too. Um, the private sanitation industry is very unregulated. Employees often work 18-hour shifts for un unfair wager wages in unsafe working conditions. Uh, as has been widely reported in the last eight years alone, at least 43 people have died in crashes related to private sanitation operations. And if we compare that to um, our fleet of DSNY trucks, um, where there has not been a fatality since, I believe, 2014, uh, that comparison is, is, is truly stark. Um, in my district in North Brooklyn, we still remember the tragic death of Natalie Ramirez, killed on his way back home from work at, uh, at Pauly G's in Greenpoint. We have to do better. Trucks routinely fail safe federal safety checks. Hundreds of thousands of dollars in wages go unpaid, and safety concerns persist. We need reforms, which is what brings us to Intro 157. This bill would help relieve overburdened communities by cutting transportation capacity in overconcentrated districts in North Brooklyn by 50 percent and 33 percent in South Bronx and Southeast Queens. These changes would also protect other communities from shouldering more than their fair share by placing a 10 percent citywide waste capacity cap in other districts to prevent them from becoming overburdened. Um, I really want to thank our chair, uh, Antonio Reynoso, again for his uh, tireless commitment. I also want to acknowledge um, community groups, Outrage, who is here. I see my friend Allison Cordero, who is here, and all the Outrage folks uh, in North Brooklyn for keeping uh, our feet to the fire as your elected representatives. I also want to thank uh, New York Lawyers for Public Interest um, uh, in, uh, and uh, uh, Coalition for Mo Environmental Justice, um, who have really uh, uh, made this a priority, uh, bringing environmental uh, justice to our communities across New York City. And with that, I'll turn it back over to the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Steve Levin. Uh, Commissioner? Yeah, we're going we're gonna to swear you in. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee today? Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Renoso and members of the City Council Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. I am Catherine Garcia, Commissioner for the New York City Department of Sanitation. With me today is Robert Orland, Deputy Commissioner for the Bureau of Legal Affairs, and Gregory Anderson, Chief of Staff for the Department. Thank you for this opportunity to testify on intro number 157B, which would reduce permitted capacity for private transfer stations in neighborhoods historically overburdened by waste transfer infrastructure. In 2006, the New York City Council adopted and the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation approved the City Solid Waste Management Plan, the plan. I don't like the acronym, the swamp. This is a fair five borough plan to sustainably manage New York City's waste and offer flexibility and resiliency in the case of a natural disaster or other emergency. The plan provides New York City with new world-class infrastructure and mandates a shift from waste export by long-haul truck to a system of marine and rail transfer stations spread throughout the five boroughs. In total, the plan will reduce truck traffic associated with waste export by more than 60 million miles per year, including more than 5 million miles in and around New York City. It will slash greenhouse gas emissions by 34,000 tons annually. 
After the closure of the Fresh Kills landfill, almost all New York City waste was exported by long haul truck from privately operated transfer stations. Because of zoning and siting restrictions, these stations were, and still are today, predominantly located in three neighborhoods in North Brooklyn, Southeast Queens, and the South Bronx. The plan is based on the concept of borough equity, that no borough should be responsible for managing another's garbage, and it will dramatically reduce truck traffic associated with waste collection and hauling in these historically overburdened poor and minority communities. The plan called for the creation of eight rail or barge-based transfer stations along with the use of an existing energy from waste facility in New Jersey. Together, these nine facilities make up a resilient and reliable network for the export of waste. They also create new waste transfer capacity that allows the city to permanently reduce permitted capacity in transfer stations in these overburdened communities. Today, seven of the nine long-term facilities outlined in the plan are operating and construction of the, of the Southwest Brooklyn Marine Transfer Station and the East 91st Street Marine Transfer Station will be completed over the coming year. Completion of these facilities is the final step toward implementing the city's long-term waste management program under the plan and will realize our goal of creating a fair five borough waste management system. The plan also recognizes that private waste, solid waste transfer stations are an integral part of New York City's solid waste management system, handling more than 20,000 tons of residential and commercial waste and commercial and demolition debris every day. These transfer stations perform a vital service for New York City every day, and as we no longer have any disposal capacity of our own, they ensure the reliable and expeditious export of our waste to disposal facilities elsewhere in New York State and across the East Coast. These transfer stations fall into three categories. First are the patressable waste transfer stations which handle refuse and may also receive organics and recyclables. Second are construction and demolition waste transfer stations which handle waste materials from construction and demolition projects for recycling or disposal. Third are film material transfer stations which handle dirt and other film material. This category is not covered by intro 157B and they are not included in my testimony today. Local Law 40 of 1990 granted the Department regulatory, permitting, and enforcement authority over waste transfer facilities. After that law was adopted, we enacted a stringent and comprehensive set of operating rules governing the use, conduct, and operation of patressable and non-patressable transfer stations. We also adopted strict siting rules which restrict both the siting of any new transfer stations and the ability of existing transfer stations to increase their daily permitted capacity. The Department adopted its rules after an extensive and transparent public review process and careful consideration of the need to balance the City's commercial waste management needs with the concerns of the communities where many of these facilities are located. As a result of these regulations, there have been no additional transfer station permit capacity added in Brooklyn 1 or in Queens 12 in more than a decade. Additionally, the Department's Permanent Inspection Unit aggressively regulates the activities of all private transfer stations operating throughout the city by making unannounced visits to conduct thorough inspections of every patressable and C&D transfer station on average once per week. The vigorous inspection and enforcement efforts by the department have contributed to an overall reduction in the number of transfer station permits in the city by nearly two-thirds since Local Law 40 was enacted in 1990 to just 38 patressable and C&D transfer stations operating today. Every year, New Yorkers generate more than 3 million tons of residential waste and recyclables and another 3 million tons of commercial waste and recyclables. While the Department's primary focus on the collection and disposal of residual waste, a number of our plans and policies address the commercial waste system. Under One New York, the plan for a strong and dust city, Mayor de Blasio laid out an ambitious goal of sending zero waste to landfills by 2030. Through a combination of new policies and programs, legislative reforms, and partnerships with the private sector, we are making great strides towards this goal on both the residential and commercial waste streams. In December 2016, the Department promulgated new commercial recycling rules to make recycling easier and more understandable for businesses to follow. In the past, the Department's rules designated recyclable material for source separation based on different business sectors of our city. The current rules that we began enforcing last summer 
now make recycling easier and more consistent for businesses. Today, New Yorkers are recycled are required to recycle the same things at work and in commercial establishments as they do at home. We also require certain food service establishments to separate the food waste they generate for separate collection. Local Law 146 of 2013 requires that select food waste, food waste generating businesses separate out their organic material to ensure its diversion from landfills. The law provides a phased in approach intended to foster the expansion of organic processing capacity needed to make organic diversion viable over the long term. Last year, the department designated the second phase in of food generating businesses required, required to source separate their organic waste. As processing capacity in the region continues to evolve and grow, we will expand this requirement to more food service establishment. One New York City also calls for dramatic improvements to air quality in New York City, including by reducing emissions from heavy duty truck fleets. Local Law 145 of 2013 requires that all private waste collection trucks be equipped with an EPA certified 2007 or later engine or best available retrofit technology by January 1, 2020. Combined with new federal emissions requirements, this regulation will dramatically reduce emissions of harm harmful particulate matter and other air pollutants by the private hauling industry. In addition, we are working towards the implementation of commercial waste zones in New York City. This initiative represents a dramatic overhaul of the private waste hauling industry that will create a safe and efficient system that offers low cost, high quality service while achieving our zero waste goals. In 2016, the department, in close partnership with the Business Integrity Commission, began working to develop an implementation plan for commercial waste zones. Over the last year, our team has held 150 meetings with more than 100 different stakeholders, including private carters, industry associations, business groups, labor organizations, environmental justice advocates, and elected officials. The concept is simple. Instead of up to 50 haulers operating in a single neighborhood on a nightly basis, there will be just a handful. These companies will be selected through a competitive bidding process that will identify the haulers that can provide the best service at the lowest price for each area. The resulting contracts will include standards for customer service, safety and labor conditions to raise the bar for the hauling industry and ensure all players operate on a level playing field. With fewer trucks on the streets and shorter routes, zone collection will also mean less unsafe driving behavior and worker fatigue and improved traffic and air quality. A zone system will also dramatically reduce truck traffic associated with this industry by 60% or more while maintaining high quality and low cost service to New York City businesses. It will also be safer, fairer, and more sustainable than the system that reigns today. This initiative will improve the quality of life for New Yorkers living and working across the city, but these benefits will be particularly felt in the neighborhoods with the highest concentration of transfer stations. The exact communities we are discussing today we are on track to release the implementation plan this summer. I will now turn to the legislation that is the subject of today's hearing. Intro 157B, which would reduce permitted capacity at private waste transfer station in four designated districts. The bill would reduce permitted capacity at transfer stations in Brooklyn Community District 1 by 50%. It would reduce capacity in Queens Community District 12 and Bronx Community Districts 1 and 2 by 33%. The anticipated reductions would take place after October 1st, 2019, and would be implemented at the time a transfer station's permit is renewed. The bill also allows for certain limited exemptions to the reductions in permitted capacity for activities consistent with the city's goals. It would allow these limited exemptions for processing recyclables and organic waste and for dirt diverting construction and demolition debris to beneficial use. The bill would also fully exempt facilities that export waste by rail and have on-site rail infrastructure. In addition, the bill would allow facilities to increase their permits by up to 20% in the future to accommodate additional processing equipment for recyclables or organic waste. These exemptions reward facilities that make investments to help us achieve our zero waste goals and create a more sustainable waste management system. Last August, the mayor announced the administration's support for this bill, and I am proud to stand with the sponsors in support of this important legislation. 
Intro 157B represents the final step envisioned under the Solid Waste Management Plan, and it will bring much needed relief to these communities that have borne the burden of our waste management infrastructure for far too long. In closing, I want to thank the sponsors of this legislation for their relentless uh, efforts to bring relief to these overburdened communities. Moreover, I want to thank the activists and organizers, many of whom are here today, for their work over the last several decades to fight for equity and justice. My predecessors and I have testified before this committee several times over the last three decades on this topic, and I know this relief cannot come soon enough. I am now happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. I want to start with asking, uh, so at least I guess some fact checking on my, on my part. Um, <coughs> what is the total citywide capacity for the city currently? Uh, in terms of CND and Petrasable at private, it is 46,461 tons. So about 46,000 tons, to, or 46,000. What is the average daily throughput in these private facilities? 20,603 tons. Okay, so less than half of the permitted capacity is being used in the city of New York? Correct. Okay. Um, how much excess capacity currently exists in the system? The exact number? It's 26,000 tons, I guess? I could answer that question. I did, okay, I did the math. If you were going to the math for me, that's fine. Yes. In the last five years, what has been the highest daily throughput? So this is when okay. in the last five years, how much has the city, what is the highest the city has ever produced I, trash in private industry? I don't know, but I would say it's going to be uh, at some point after a snowstorm. After a snowstorm. Yeah. Okay, so, so let's say outside of, outside of those emergencies, um, have we gone, now that we're doing about uh, 20,000 tons. So on a regular week, the average daily throughput is pretty steady. So um, very rarely goes extremely high unless it's like an emergency, like a snowstorm right, or a Right, if sandy. we don't collect for a few days, so the private sector often will miss collection, so then you end up collecting everything on the same okay. day. Um, how many waste transfer stations are there citywide? Uh, there are 38 per trestle and CND citywide. Um, in the districts that we talked about, Southeast Queens, the South Bronx, and North Brooklyn, um, how many waste transfer stations are in those communities? 26. Okay. Can you tell us the, tell us the approximate citywide capacity and citywide throughput in these districts? So um, in terms of the amount of overall throughput in these, uh, the permitted capacity is about 33,000 tons and your throughput is about 14, 15, 14, 15,000 tons. So out of the 46,000 tons citywide, 33,000 are coming from just these three communities or are in these three communities. Yeah, a little bit. I'm, I'm probably rounding down, but yes. Okay. Um, can you briefly explain the city's regulations as they relate to transfer stations? Certainly. Do you want me to talk about the siting rules or about the yeah. operation and maintenance portion of it? The siting rules first, yeah. Um, so we restrict the siting of transfer stations and there are very specific rules in terms of uh, what may or may not be put in particularly, they're actually by these districts. Um, the buffer distance, for example, in Brooklyn One would be 700 feet. The distance between uh, transfer stations would be 400 feet. And then for districts, that's the top, then the bottom of the range is there's a 400 foot standard on both of those. And then there's the requirement that uh, for any new transfer station in Brooklyn One, it would only be in an M2 or an M3, while if it's in a district outside of the ones in the legislation and rules, it would be, it could be in an M1, though this really hasn't happened. We've seen a continued decline in the number of permits in the city. Okay, so, so long as the, so those, a lot of these I just want to put in perspective. Um, industrial business zones or industrial areas in the city, uh, many poor communities uh, abide or abut a lot of these transfer stations because there are places where no one wanted to live in the past. So it took upon poor people from the Bronx and from Brooklyn to have to live next to industrial parks so they could get affordable rent. So I want to make sure that we put uh, like a historical context in perspective as to why near industrial business zones in the city of New York there's so many poor people, or at least black and brown people. So um, just want to talk about a little bit of history there for us. Um, what, what are typical types of violations for these transfer stations? Uh, the most typical violation is going to be around parking and okay. about uh, around having tra uh, trucks, um, sort of three hour storage, detached trailer, uh, parked on a sidewalk, double parked vehicle. That's by far the majority of our violations. Um, 
but you know they could also take unacceptable material, um, leachate issues, drainage issues. Uh, but those are are much less likely. The biggest ones are uh, around parking issues, and then the second largest one uh, would be sort of noxious liquids, tracking, spillage, those sorts of of of. Uh, so when it, when it comes to these violations, is there a difference between the what I call the bad players and the good players? The let's say the company that gets the least amount of violations versus the company that gets the most violations. Is there a disparity? Does that exist? There there really isn't. I mean, it, it's um, what we see is that uh, particularly in many of the for the transfer stations that are in Brooklyn North and in the South Bronx that are in M3 zones, it's less true in, in Queens 12, are on larger properties, and therefore it's easier for them to comply. Um, they have much more land, they have adequate queuing space, they take place, their operations are away from their property boundaries, thus you have much more limited nuisance conditions. So if your front door is on a sidewalk, it's very different than if your front door is 500 feet away from the street. Um, but most of these facilities have been operating for a long time and they are subject to very frequent inspections. So we don't see a great disparity between any of the transfer stations in terms of the number of violations. Okay, so it's pretty even across the board whether we would consider them I mean, I do a small think, or a large. Yeah, no, I mean, I do think that like, you know, one of the things is this much regulation over this long a period of time, the really, really bad players have actually gotten pushed out of the system. Then um, has there been any reduction in the amount of throughput in the overburden districts since the MTS is opened? I don't know the answer to that. No. Okay, so two MTS is open and there hasn't been a significant amount of throughput that has moved around, even though the foundation of the MTSs or the Marine Transfer Stations and the Swamp Plan was to figure out a way to relieve these communities. Right, um, no, so that. there is a lot less residential material from DSNY going through these communities, but that has been supplanted by new private material moving from other places into those facilities. All right, so then, so what happens is trash from the residential side gets we'll moved to these MTSs, but then these private companies pick up some other type of trash, so it ends up wa being a wash in these communities of color, so we don't necessarily see a relief related to MTSs and marine transfer stations, so. That has not been the experience so far. That is what? That has not been the experience so far. So you just said that, um, the MTSs have allowed for you to move trash, yeah. city's trash, um, to the MTSs, which relieves some capacity, but then it has been supplanted, that capacity, by other methods of trash right. by the private companies. Yes. Okay, all right. I'm um, saying the goal that you are premising is not been the experience we've had. Right, exactly. I appreciate that. Um, Okay, so can DSNY discuss the expansion of recycling requirements on commercial businesses that have been implemented in the last few years? Um, so absolutely, I mean, so as, as we've talked about, we have, uh, we changed the rules for commercial businesses to just simplify them. Um, and so we have worked very hard to begin doing enforcement of those businesses to make sure that people are source separating uh, their recycling. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that also this has been in somewhat in partnership with the Business Integrity Commission who has brought cases yeah. against private carters around mixing. Mm -hmm. um, and so we will continue to do that, but we, we are pleased to see this go into effect and we are working towards getting broader compliance from the commercial sector. And I, I know we asked about, uh, previously I asked a question related to um, violations in these in these stations. What about 311 complaints? Do you keep track of how many facilities receive 311 complaints? We do. I don't have those numbers with me though. But, right, we do. but, uh, but do And we do respond to all of them. Okay. So if there is a 311, you'll get me that information. Yeah. But um, off the top of your head, do you feel that there's a disparity there? Or is it even the same way the violations that you issue are? Or are there facilities receiving more 311 violations than others? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that, so I don't, I don't want to speculate on what the complaint data might say, but we do respond to all 311 complaints. And since uh, the recycling requirements that changed in commercial businesses, have you seen uh, any change in the commercial diversion rates? Have we seen changes? We haven't seen changes. Never mind. We are still seeing minimal diversion rates, but we also are starting to look at some of the other places where material may be going in terms of uh, 
recyc pure recycling facility that are not transfer stations. So even as we implemented law to uh, increase diversion rates, um, asking these private carters, I guess, to do more, asking these businesses to do more, we've seen very little change when it comes to diversion rates in the city of New York related to the requirements, the recycling requirements that you asked to be implemented recently. Um, so one of the challenges is that our baseline diversion rate was always just a modeled number um, because we, until very recently, did not have any regulatory authority over any paper processors or anyone who was a pure recycling facility. Um, so I didn't have any idea what tonnage was going through there. That will get better, but I don't think that we can definitively say, oh, this has been really phenomenal or really terrible yet. I think we need a little bit more time. Is it because we don't have the information? Yeah, I, don't ha I didn't have a baseline. I mean, I had the baseline that we had was a model, uh, not a actual tonnage count. So some private, uh, you're going to hear the private haulers here, they're going to say that they're over-regulated, that they're regulated by the state, by the city, by the federal government, but there's no information or very little information related to the work that they were doing related to like diversion rates and recycling in the past? Well, I mean, they... they they might have taken recycling to a facility that I didn't know what tonnage was moving through there. Um, so no, I, and I honestly don't think they are overregulated. Um, I think that considering uh, what we know about the private industry today uh, and some of the challenges that they seem to face in operating safely in the city of New York, um, that we really need to make some very significant reforms to this industry. Uh, are you familiar with uh, sanitation salvage? Um, not directly. We don't have any direct involvement, so I only am familiar with what I have read in the paper. Okay. Do you regulate in any way, shape, or form, like the worker safety? No. That is really who, what agency? Uh, so, for most of the worker safety related to operating a vehicle, is actually regulated by the State Department of Transportation. So but there are some things that I know that they do that are basically illegal all the time. You are not supposed to ride a step on a private sanitation vehicle. It's illegal. It's illegal to do what? To ride the back of a truck. At all? At all. So you know that in a lot of these cases, the private sanitation workers have an enormous amount of stops that they got to get through and feel that riding step or the back of these vehicles is the only way they're going to get that job done in a reasonable amount of time. So, so... One of the things that I think is inherently true about uh, what happens in the private carding industry is because the way the competition is designed and because of the way that we have allowed it to be regulated, you almost are creating, there's almost no way for a private sanitation worker to complete the job every night without violating traffic standards, without, without speeding, without blowing a light, without going the wrong way, without riding on the back. Um, because otherwise they're currently, what is it like, sometimes they're working in 16, 18 hour shift, which is actually also a violation of federal law under the CDL, um, would be 20 hours. I mean, like there, it, isn't, it isn't actually conceivable to get the work done. Right, right, exactly. They, there's no way in 12 hours they get a thousand stops done without having two workers in the back of a truck and a driver. Um, and those are what I consider the bad players, by the way, Commissioner, the ones that make it so that these workers have to do more hours that these workers have to hire people off the books, right? That these workers are in unsafe trucks, unsafe facilities, and I'm trying to address that issue. And I, what I want to do is try to figure out a way to get the best players to get the most work and get these bad players that I consider bad players that are doing this to these workers out of the market completely. And when we talk about that and the fact that you, as the Department of Sanitation, are not responsible for that and that there is no city agency necessarily that's responsible for overseeing that outside of the state. It's concerning because, again, there's a narrative out there that the industry is overregulated, uh, but the city does not regulate them when it comes to these, to these issues, especially that seeing a, a, a supervisor from the Department of Sanitation sees a, a truck with two people in the back of it, they're not going to stop that truck. No, no. Okay. Um, I think that we need to have, like, for, for us to address all of those issues, it will be a broader uh, reform that will have to take place that I think has to take place through zoning will be the only way to actually achieve the goals that you are talking about. Okay. How many, so if you don't mind me, how many hours a day does the, does a sanitation worker from the city of New York, uh, how many hours does, do they work? Their regular shift is eight hours. 
um, during snow operations. We are in split, which are 12 hour shifts. Um, occasionally someone will work a 13 just because of the way it ends up coming in and getting like, if they getting back to a garage, but that's really the limit. Um, and we try and make sure we're not ever, you know, one of, one of my biggest challenges during the winter season is making sure I keep my nights nights and my days days. And I'm not flipping people back and forth and making it so that they're inherently sleep deprived. Um, and your trucks, what is the oldest truck, let's say, right now? So we're going to go for the worst truck. Oh, my you God. I, 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 I don't know. That, I, I can't say. But, like, most of our truck, all of our trucks are compliant with uh, uh, either 2007 standard or BART technology. But most of my, the vast majority of my trucks are um, post-2007. But would you say most of your trucks are uh, younger than seven years old? Uh, no, my average age is, we are getting to a replacement cycle of eight years, but we're not there yet. Uh, so my average age is probably more like five years, six years. Five or six years. Is probably my average, where I've got like some brand so your new. Truck, and so I'm most of your trucks on average are about five years old. No, I mean, I'd have to get back to you, but that's probably in the right range. Okay. Um, do you know the average age of a private sanitation truck? No, but we did. I know that the Business Integrity Committee did just ask the industry for that information to see if they are coming into compliance with the local law regarding air quality. Um, because, you know, one of the things that they will start looking at when they are doing their permits is whether or not they have a plan to meet those standards. So through a commercial <laughs> waste zone system, um, we, would able, we would be able to regulate that. We would be able to tell a company, hey, we don't want your trucks to be older than 10 years old. You are not going to get the contract unless X, Y, and Z happens. That so you won't way. get a contract unless you have high safety standards, you got good trucks, you're recycling at a high rate, your facility's up to par. Yes. We can't do that right now. We can't ask uh, carding companies to, uh, to have new trucks or newer trucks. Uh, no, I don't have that authority. You don't have that authority. And I don't but believe the do Business commercial Integrity Commission has that authority either. Right. But if we have a commercial waste franchising, we would be able to um, ask them to have newer trucks, which is better for the workers, where they have new trucks. Well, we're assuming that it's better for the workers to have a newer truck. I'm just, uh, I guess. Um, you know, they like cup holders too. So, so again, part of my legislation, what I'm really trying to do here, Commissioner, is cap the amount of trash that can go through these communities. There's always going to be a new type of trash that might need to get recycled, that might need to be diverted. And these, traditionally, that new trash or these new methods always come through our community. What I'm trying to do is say, you know what? If you get a new trash, if you're, if you're doing organics now, we're going to do straws later on, whatever it is that we're going to pick up, we're going to stop We're not picking up straws separately. Yeah. Okay. We're going to do something different with no, straws. There's not, there's not going to be a, a, a there's straw no straw. Truck. There's not going to be a truck just for straws. No, no um, truck just for straws. <laughs> the point being is that what we want to say is you can, all the initiatives that you want to bring forward, like organics, we want to encourage that. But we want to stop sending it to the same three communities. Let's start spreading the love of trash to other places. And the only way we're going to do that is if we cap it. Um, and in capping it, uh, there are some facilities that will lose um, capacity. Mm -hmm. um, and in losing that capacity, they're either going to sell it or some of them might shut down or some of them will be able to work through Within that. that yeah. uh, but the point here is that we want to make sure that we bring about environmental justice to these mm -hmm. communities. I want to talk about another community that got environmental justice. It was a St Staten Island had something. Uh, it was called the Fresh Kills Landfill. There were stories, which now I know are not true, that you could actually see the landfill from space. Um, that's not true now. But they shut down the, the landfill in Staten Island and are building an amazing park, a beautiful park, a huge park. And in turn, that community got environmental justice, appropriately so, by shutting down the Fresh Kills landfill and making it into a park. And in doing so, all that trash moved to three communities of color. Um, the Staten Island district that the Fresh Kills landfill was shut, was shut down for, that is a predominantly white district. Would you agree with that? statement? Um, uh, South Staten Island is mostly white? Uh, it is definitely whiter than the north side of Staten, okay. Island, of okay. Staten Island. Yes, South Staten Island is whiter than the north, north shore of Staten Island. All right, so um, okay. All right. So I want to pass it over to Council Member uh, Steve Levin, followed by Council Member Steve Levin. I just want to acknowledge the fact uh, we've also been joined by Councilmember Cabrera from the Bronx. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. 
Uh, thank you, Commissioner. I just have a, a few questions, and I, I, I know that the, the chair covered a lot of the important ground. Um, uh, in, ta in, in looking, foreseeing the impact of this bill and as it relates to the MTSs, do you foresee uh, any new waste transfer stations coming online uh, aside from MTSs, but like any new private waste transfer stations coming online either in overburdened communities or in other communities throughout New York City, you know, it, to the best of your knowledge? To the best of my knowledge besides the, there's one transfer station up in the northern Bronx that may open, um, it's on the border. Uh, but other than that, I do not know of any additional capacity. Um, I do know there has been some, there has been some selling of permits, like Cooper Tank built a very big facility, but it didn't o increase overall capacity in that community district. I don't know of any pure new transfer capacity that's uh, mm -hmm. being contemplated. Um, do you do you see the um, the, do you see that there's going to be a need for uh, new capacity or significantly new throughput um, to accommodate growth, growth within the city? You know, based on what we've seen so far, the answer to that would be no, based on the legislation and what we're building and what has been sort of produced, even at sort of this height of the, um, uh, building boom. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that there could be some impacts that are unanticipated by the new Part 360 rules that are coming out of the state. Um, but at this point, I, I don't see that um, that there's been a real peak in the numbers uh, compared to what you're looking at in terms of the reductions. And then on the MTSs, what's the total capacity of MTSs aggregate? Uh, ten, well, the MTS is in Staten Island, which is also our facility, mm -hmm. is 10,706 tons. Okay. And that's all, that's all putressible? That's all putressible. Um, now, in response to the chair's questions, you said that you're not seeing a reduction in throughput from the private sanitation transfer stations because... In your districts. In our districts, because due to the MTSs. So if, more, if, if residential capacity is moving to the MTSs, what is that ba being backfilled? Just new commercial? New commercial counts. That there were, is where were they before? Well, it's just a question of like uh, the MTSs, I mean the transfer stations are competitive. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when they lost the business from the department, I think they went out and tried to find carters who would come and tip at their facilities. These would be carters from, are the, all the carters from within the five boroughs? You can have any carter could be from a different state. I mean, like as long as they can, you can come, and then you pay them. That is how it works. Okay, so it's not necessarily capacity that's even coming from, or, or throughput that's coming from the five boroughs. I mean, it's, the, like the waste through, it's likely throughput that's coming from the five boroughs. But I'm saying there's nothing inherently. Mm -hmm. If you know Long Island's Petrescible yeah. Station was charging a thousand dollars a ton, and Brooklyn's charging forty, maybe it makes sense to make the drive. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just straight market dynamics at that point. They mm -hmm. go out and market to the private carters that we're the best, we'll, we're, you should come and tip in our facility. And the MTSs, will, will they be taking any private carters or? It is presumed that they, we will eventually get to private carting. Um, right now my main goal is to get them open and right. operating right. and figure out how to do that well. Okay. Um, so in your estimation and having conducted a thorough analysis of this, you see that the reductions uh, envisioned by this legislation um, would not put the city at a disadvantage when it comes to being able to handle day-to-day -day accessible believe. and also deal with building cycles with booms and busts on the CND? From what we have seen, based on the what we're projecting in terms of what this current bill says, mm -hmm. um, 
is we believe that the city would be able to handle uh, its growth as well as its uh, building industry. I don't, that there would be there would be a place for someone to go and transfer waste to make sure that it was moved out of the city. And and I'm going to just ask you whether you believe this is true that with the current version of the bill there will be some waste transfer stations that will likely cut into the the capacity reduction will likely cut into throughput. Yes. There will be many where the capacity reductions won't even get to current average throughput. Correct. Right. Um, and um, no, no waste transfer station is, is going to be seeing, um, you know, uh, an actual reduction of anywhere close to 50 percent of their actual throughput, because even on the 50, in, the, in Brooklyn, a 50 percent reduction, it's just, there's, there's nobody that's, that's actually hitting their capacity without any of the rail or, or um, recycling exemptions. Um, there are a few that are close that are at like 49.9 percent. Okay. 44.9 um, percent, 48 percent. So there are a few that are close. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can you explain a little bit more about why uh, the administration supports a rail and recycling exemption? I think it's fairly obvious on its face, but. Um, Certainly. So, I mean, for, for rail, obviously. Um, most, the back end part of this, so it's not just the private carters or sanitation that comes in the front door, there's a big back door, and the back door is usually a tractor trailer. Mm -hmm. um, so we want the back door to be a rail line rather than a diesel tractor trailer, or be in part because it requires so many tractor trailers to actually move the waste uh, compared to one rail line that might go out any given night. Mm -hmm. What about recycling? And then recycling is like we want to make sure that materials are being beneficially reused. Um, we think that's important just in general to not be landfilling all of the city's waste. And so we wanted to try and incentivize the transfer stations to do the right thing. And sometimes that requires them to make investments in equipment, uh, both on the C&D side as well as the um, commercial side. But we think that it's the right place to be. And how about organics? Well, you know, that is my favorite. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do, want, we do want folks to be, that is, that is the most greenhouse gas intensive portion of our waste stream. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and we do want to make sure that we are really ensuring that that is getting beneficially reused either as an energy source or as a soil amendment as part of composting. Um, and so this, there's some interrelation then between what this bill would do and the efforts of DSNY over the last four years, four and a half years around organics, right? Right. No, certainly like, you know, we're looking through a prism of making sure that we can really drive the city to its zero waste goals and we don't cut those off. Okay. Um, I obviously very much appreciate um, uh, DSNY's working with us for uh, over a very extended period of time on trying to find the right balance with this legislation. Um, and, uh, you know, we think that this, this bill achieves that balance. And so we, we just want to greatly, I just want to acknowledge our great appreciation for uh, the amount of staff time that your staff put into this and, and, and working with both the chair and myself uh, to find that right balance. So right, that no, I mean, we think that this is a really balanced bill um, that takes into account a lot of uh, both the city's overall goal of ensuring that we have a resilient system, mm -hmm. uh, the business community's concern about um, big changes for them, and then, you know, these communities that have suffered uh, with an, an undue burden of pretty much the history of where did we put manufacturing zones and where did we allow people to live. Right. Well, thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Chair. All right. I want to thank you for your time, Commissioner. I appreciate you coming here and supporting um, the bill um, and for your testimony. I hope uh, a couple of your folks can stay here to listen to the rest of the testimony from um, all sides. Uh, thank you for your time again. Thank you. Tegir Senti or Set Setney, I can't read it. Leslie Velasquez, Jen from Clean Up North Brooklyn. I'm not even gonna try that one. Sorry. 
uh, Chen Bao Kin, and Melissa. Ishan, Asher just hooked me up. So we have, um, we have seven panels that are going to be speaking today. So in an effort to not be here till six, we're going to have a two-minute two time limit on your testimony. So try out your best to, to stay within that time. Um, and we're going to start from this side moving, from my left moving right. So where's that, where's that spot? Let's put it right. Then the names of the people. So, Shen Bao, you can start, yes. Hello. I don't know English, but I'm speaking Chinese and Cantonese. My name is Bao Ching Chen. I'm in the Lulingau Metropolitan for 10 years. For 10 years, Hello, everyone. My name is Chen Bao Qin. Sorry, I only speak Chinese Cantonese, so Ms. Fong will be translating for me. I'm a resident at 609 Metropolitan Avenue, where I have lived for 10 years. While I have lived there, there are constantly trucks, whether it be dump trucks, garbage trucks, that always pass by my residence. It is very noisy, a lot of pollution in the air. Mutinta of the 10 years that my husband and I have lived at 609 Metropolitan, five, after five of those years, my husband, has, um, my husband has developed symptoms of coughing. For me, I have uh, had a nose allergy. I'm constantly sneezing. I can't breathe very well. The two of us, we live on the first floor of 609 Metropolitan. Whenever the trucks pass by, we always hear them, and there's a lot of dust that comes into our apartment. I'll give you like one more minute just because it's translated, so I just want to make sure she gets her time. So continue. Uh, so my final ask is to the city council. I hope that you can reduce the number of dump trucks as well as waste transfer stations in our neighborhood. Can you do that for me? And the residents at 609 Metropolitan Avenue. Right, so I'm a senior at 609 Metropolitan. Having to breathe in this dust every day isn't right, it isn't fair, and it's very hard to live like this as an older person. Well, thank you for your testimony, and that's exactly what we're trying to do here, 
in passing intro 157. I really appreciate you taking the time to come to City Hall and uh, putting forth your testimony, living on Metropolitan, which is a truck route where I know a lot of trucks um, pass by uh, going and coming to these transfer stations. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you can stay there. You can stay there until the next panel comes on. Melissa, you want to go next? Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. My name is Melissa Yashan, and I'm a senior staff attorney in the Environmental Justice Program at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. NILPI has advocated and litigated for environmental justice in New York City for more than two decades. NILPI's Environmental Justice Program has focused on the topic of today's hearing, trying to bring equity into our city's waste system throughout the history of this issue moving through the council. And I have worked in the area of waste regulation myself for more than four years. I would like to thank Chair Reynoso and the sponsor of this important legislation, Council Member Levin, as well as the other members of the Sanitation Committee for the opportunity to discuss the troubling problem of the inequity in our city's waste system and for continuing to support and advance waste equity legislation. This bill represents the first step towards much needed and long awaited relief for the communities in our city that have borne the brunt of our garbage for too long. I would also li like to thank Commissioner Garcia and DSNY for their efforts to find a way to work together to bring more equity into our city's waste processing system and their support of Intro 157. The fact is that waste is one of the most unequally distributed environmental burdens in our city and one the council has the obligation to finally address by passing Intro 157. The journey leading us to this hearing, where the council is once again considering a proposal to address these in inequities, has been a long one. As the commissioner said, the Solid Waste Management Plan approved in 2006 specifically calls for reduction in private transfer station capacity in four city districts, mostly comprised of communities of color. And council members representing these overburdened communities have been trying to pass a waste equity bill since at least 2011. Here we are 12 years after the swamp was ratified and three years after the last hearing on a previous version of this bill and the neighborhoods that were specifically targeted for relief by that plan continue to play host to more than 75% of private transfer station capacity and handle about two-thirds of our entire city's waste. As you have heard and will hear, residents in these communities face dangerous streets due to speeding garbage trucks, have higher rates of asthma and respiratory and health problems. Everyone knows the problems. So Melissa, just yeah. hold your breath. I'm going to add another minute. I'm okay. going to make it three minutes because it's obviously ridiculous. Uh, I don't want everyone speeding through their testimony. I want to be able to hear people. <laughs> um, so we're going to do three minutes. So you got another minute okay. to, to make down. a statement. Um, and then we'll give everyone moving forward three minutes. So um, in, in every panel, I apologize. But I didn't think two minutes went that quickly. Time flies when you're having fun. OK. Um, so I was listing the noxious effects of living in these communities, which include asthma and respiratory health problems due to idling diesel burning trucks congregating around the transfer stations, foul odors, toxic leachate, and vermin that these garbage facilities so notoriously produce. By reducing permitted capacity in North Brooklyn, Southeast Queens, and the South Bronx, Intro 157 shows these communities that they have not been forgotten. This legislation follows through on the city's commitment to finally cap the amount of waste it sends to these neighborhoods. And it is a first step to actually bringing them some relief from their decades-long barrage of garbage. The bill also helps the city accomplish its zero waste goals. Intro 157 includes incentives for facilities to increase recycling and organics processing capacity that can nudge New York City's abysmal recycling and diversion rates a bit higher and closer to those of leading cities. Finally, incentivizing expansion and investments in the use of rail and barge to export our waste will not only reduce the city's greenhouse gas emissions, but may also start to improve our notably poor air quality and reduce the especially high rate of particulate matter pollution that is the norm in these communities. Intro 157 delivers overdue protections to communities that have been waiting for decades for some sort of action. With the passage of Intro 157 as a first step, we look forward to continuing our work with the Council and DSNY in implementing system-wide reforms to our waste system through the upcoming, upcoming zoning system, which we believe will pick up where this important legislation leaves off and move us towards true waste equity in the city. Thank you very much. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Leslie Velasquez, and um, I manage environmental justice programs at El Puente. El Puente is a community-based organization focused on building leadership for peace and justice in Williamsburg South Side and Bushwick. 
Since 1982, Puente has provided holistic programming fo uh, centered on leadership development for young people and their families involving health, education, the arts, and activism. We've also led several successful campaigns for environmental justice, and we have specifically worked to address air quality and waste equity. As a longstanding community organization and a champion of environmental justice, we were happy to discuss policies like Intro 157 that will improve environmental conditions for Los Sudes. North Brooklyn is disproportionately the most waste burden community in New York City, handling nearly 40% of the city's total waste. This burden is made even worse in our community by the clustering of other truck intensive infra infrastructure like highways and the bus depot. Consequently, our neighborhood suffers from extremely poor air quality. Last year, El Puente led an air quality study which involved community volunteers to monitor PM 2.5 levels in four parks in Williamsburg South Side. Each park had peak PM 2.5 levels four to six times higher than the maximum levels recommended by national air quality standards. The study also involved counting the number of trucks around each park, and in one park, our volunteers counted an average of 218 trucks per hour. As a result of this pollution, compared to the rest of the city, our community has high rates of emergency room visits for asthma and some of the highest rates of asthma in children. In our survey of park users through the air quality study, 23% of park users surveyed reported having asthma. In sum, the uneven distribution of waste facilities has predictably led to disproportionately poor air quality in communities like ours, and in turn, severe health disparities. It is imperative that the city remedy this injustice for the well-being of current and future generations. Intro 157 is a step in this direction. We applaud Councilmember Reynoso's re leadership on this issue and for being a tireless, tireless advocate for uh, waste equity. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Hi, my name is Tag, and I'm with Clean Up North Brooklyn. Um, thank you for letting me speak today, and thank you for having me and hearing me. 30 years ago, a waste transfer station was sited within a block from hundreds of families and businesses. Three times this community organized and fought to no avail, ignored by two different administrations. And 10 years ago, the station was taken over by the worst of the worst of operators, and the community has suffered the consequences. For the first time in decades, change is stirring in our neighborhood. Due to the help of hundreds of local families and businesses that make up Clean Up North Brooklyn, community members who have been in the neighborhood anywhere from one to 53 years. And due to partners like Align, TDT, NILPI, and NYSEJA, and our council member Antonio Reynoso, and Commissioner Catherine Garcia, thank you all. This bill acknowledges a reality that our community has known for a long time. Waste is unfairly concentrated in Southeast Queens, the South Bronx, and North Brooklyn, with 40% coming through North Brooklyn. It is not easy to live in these neighborhoods. That means if you're walking on the street, you need to be extra cautious to avoid a truck jumping the curb on a tight turn, running a stop sign, or driving the wrong way down the street to speed up their route. It means your car gets hit regularly and no one takes responsibility. It means old trucks spilling toxic leachate onto the streets and spraying diesel fumes into the air. The, sink is so, the stink is so strong that you can't open your windows and kids can't play outside. The young and elderly get sick more often and have significantly higher incidences of asthma than other neighborhoods. 157B is a step forward towards recognizing that the burden placed on these neighborhoods like ours is unjust and that no other neighborhood should have to experience it. It is a step forward in the fight to preserve equal access to a healthy environment, no matter how rich or poor you are or what color your skin is. And this is just the beginning. We need to overhaul the private waste haulers. Employees and pedestrians are dying on the streets with absolutely no consequences due to a lack of training and reckless driving encouraged by company management. Private haulers create fake unions and steal money from their employees. Meanwhile, their owners live lavish lifestyles. These companies break the law and hurt people with impunity. In 2016, we released a report, Profits Before Safety, which documented 1,200 violations of permit conditions, city and state law, in a single week. And not a single fine was issued. Once we have a cap, we need to establish a new way of keeping these bad actors accountable. We wholeheartedly support this bill and urge you all, let's not stop here. Until we can stop the abuses of the private car hauling industry, no neighborhood will be safe. Thank you, Tia. Thank you. Jen? 
Good afternoon. I want to thank you for allowing me to be here today. And I want to thank my district's council member, Antonio Reynoso, for continuing to be an advocate for environmental justice and waste equity for our community. My name is Jen Chanchana Pichier. I'm a native New Yorker, originally from Long Island City. I moved to North Brooklyn when I was 19 years old and have been living and working in North Brooklyn for the past 10 years. I'm here to represent my community, which handles nearly 40% of New York City's waste. It's no doubt that capping the amount of waste for overburdened neighborhoods such as mine will significantly improve the severe environmental harms that we have been experiencing for so long. With the high number of waste transfer stations as neighbors comes the high number of trucks coming through our community and increased number of risks and dangers my neighbors and I experience on a daily basis. My community and I compiled a short video to show you the violations and issues that we face on a daily basis. So I'm going to play that as part of my testimony. So these are the doors at Brooklyn Transfer. This means that kids living nearby can't go outside and play because it smells so bad. This means that families can't open their windows. It's a problem that the community has been dealing with for over 20 years. Si tiene aire acondicionado, se mete por el aire acondicionado. Si tiene un abanico, se mete por ahí. Mm -hmm. Y eso me ha afectado mucho porque tengo que ir al hospital dos o tres veces. ¿Por qué te afecta la respiración? La respiración y, y el alma. La última vez yo tuve dos semanas. ¿Estuviste dos semanas en el hospital? En el hospital. This is a perfect example where the driver has left the truck. Uh, unattended. Often the drivers will step out to grab some lunch and not return for 30 minutes. So leche is the little drips of trash and filth that comes out of garbage trucks. What they're supposed to do is they're supposed to spray it into their facility where they have an oil water separator that, can, that prevents it from polluting the streets, from polluting the sewers, from polluting everything. We regularly watch them power wash this leachate into our streets. Trucks blow through stop signs, they ride onto the sidewalks, they intimidate bikers and pedestrians when they're rolling up into the station, drive the wrong way down the one-way street, they'll steal our parking signs so that way residents and workers can't park where they're allowed to park and it really feels like they have a hold on our streets, like they control our streets, like they're lawless in our streets, like they can do whatever they want, and like the health and safety of the people in our community come last. Nobody's enforcing anything against them. The Department of Sanitation isn't doing anything. The people who are supposed to do something aren't. So we are. And we're just a community of the people who live here. We have a lot of money. It's not going to be easy. So but we got to keep going, don't give up. I feel helpless with these people. I feel helpless because they got the money. Money is power, I guess. People's health are more important than your business. That's what we should say. Our health is more important than your business. So thank you for watching. Um, I hope that helped clarify. Thank you, and I just want to acknowledge the fact that we've also been joined by Councilmember Rafael Espinal and Councilmember Brad Lander. Just want to say that five-star carding, um, two employees, two union employees from the Teamsters came and testified here uh, one day. The next day they got fired. Yes. For testifying about the conditions that they were working under in, in Five Star. I think that's how we found out that the station was privately owned as opposed to owned by the city, and that's what motivated a lot of community members to get involved and start to educate themselves about the issues surrounding. Yeah. Uh, and I just want to say that we had a rally. We had a rally to fight for union jobs two days later, and they were reinstated into their jobs. So it just shows that one, if you're going to testify here, we're always going to have your back, especially if you're talk talking about safety conditions and, and what you think is a problem. Um, but it's also making sure that this, that we continue to fight for high quality jobs in this industry and that we don't allow for um, employees to uh, 
uh, scare or use scare tactics or threaten employees when they come here to testify about their working conditions. So I want to thank, uh, thank Clean Up North Brooklyn for everything that you've done in organizing and bringing attention to this issue. El Puente, thank you so much as well. And of course, thank you for your legal representation always um, from NOPI. So thank you for this uh, um, panel. And I think uh, Councilman Brad Lando wants to say a few words. Thank you very much, Chair Reynoso. Uh, I won't go on too long, but I just wanted to come and express my solidarity uh, with you and Councilmember Levin and your constituents and your community, with the advocates from North Brooklyn, with the workers in the private sanitation industry. I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of 157B, and it is time for this council to do everything we can to move forward. Obviously, the inequities that communities in New York City face a total unfairness in where we process our waste and what that means for people's health and quality of life is really unacceptable. It violates the idea of the city's fair share siting system established in 1989 and we haven't done anything meaningful about it. This 157B will be a strong step forward and I also hope that we will continue to push forward hard toward the district model to make sure that we can reduce unnecessary truck trips, uh, really achieve environmental and sustainability goals, and protect workers, obviously, what we have been seeing through ProPublica uh, uh, reporting and other worker organizing in recent days is just appalling. So thank you guys for pushing us to do better. Uh, I hope we'll be able to move forward quickly with this bill and then continue to make progress in cleaning up the commercial waste industry. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Lander. And I think you made reference, um, Seguir, to uh, a worker that was uh, run over by a truck, and the truck driver and the helper, because this was a third person on the truck, said that he was a homeless man that jumped in front of the truck when he was actually being employed off the books by Sanitation Salvage, um, one of the affected, that one of the stations that would be affected. They have a, something that we call fake unions. Um, that go in there to take opportunities away from real unions, like the Teamsters and the laborers that have been doing this for years, that are actually represent their, their workers. They have a fake union, they, get, they don't care about safety, they're willing to lie about an uh, off-the-books worker. Um, those are the type of people we're targeting. We are going after those folks. I wanna make sure that I'm clear that I'm going after locations like that that put profits over their workers. Like, we won't allow that to happen in the city council, and this legislation would help start address that on top of commercial waste franchising. So I know that you want more, and I'm focused on that. And then I just want to make one last reference to the video. This is not a waste transfer station in the M3 zone that's, like, really deep, because if the truck was doing that, if the truck was doing that in an M3 zone where there are other trucks and there's space and things like that, it would be more justified. This is across the street from their home. Uh, they live in 120 Thames, and what's the address of that? 115 Thames. There's a, literally two houses away, uh, two houses numbers away from them, and they're not the ones on the corner, so I want to be mindful that the waste transfer station that you see there is across the street from their home, or right next to their home. This is not one in the middle of, you know, the middle of nowhere where it makes sense, where you would have trucks doing what they have to do. It's right next to a residential home. We're trying to change that in North Brooklyn, the South Bronx, and Southeast Queens. So I want to thank you for your testimony and your time. Thank you. Our next uh, panel is Kendall Christensen, Miguel Martinez, Carla Cruz, Steve Changaris, and I thought there was another one. The other guy. Oh, another person left. So we're gonna we're gonna start now from my right to moving left. So Carla, if you want to start. Good afternoon. My name is Carla Cruz, and I am testifying on behalf of Greater New York Lesson. We are the labor management fund of the Mason Tenders District Council, and we represent over 1,000 hard worker members of Laborers Local 108. I want to start by thanking Chair Antonio Reynoso for the opportunity to testify today and to voice our concerns regarding Intro 157. 
Over the last several years, our organization has worked closely with you and the council over this issue, and we look forward to continuing this work to come to a resolution where we can both reach the waste equity intro 157 seeks while also protecting the quality jobs that organized labor has collectively bargained for in the private waste industry. Our members, including those from our sister locals, local 78 and 79, work, live, and support families in the five boroughs. Our membership is made up predominantly of people of color, many of whom are residents of the identified overburden districts. They too are affected by pollution and will benefit from clean air and waste equity. Our opposition has never been to fair distribution of the city's waste or to the relief of the communities that are most affected by the consequences of unequal distribution. Our opposition has always been and continues to be the short-sighted plan that council has proposed for possible displaced workers, especially those who work for employers who provide careers rather than low-wage jobs for New York residents. Creating waste equity and fair distribution does not need to cost job opportunities for hardworking New Yorkers. Local 108 has made incredible strides in the industry when it comes to wages, benefits, and standards. More importantly, union shops provide the training and safety measures needed to work in such toxic and dangerous environments. This bill does not protect the crucial gains made in one of the most dangerous occupations in this country. This bill penalizes workers for the absence of real reform to the industry. We believe we can do both. We can bring justice to overburdened communities and protect hard fought middle class jobs. Thank you. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Thank you for holding this hearing and for allowing me to op the opportunity to testify before you today. My name is Miguel Martinez. I am a proud New Yorker and a member of Labor's Local 108. Over 21 years ago, before I joined Labor's Local 108, I resided in the Mitchell Projects in Mount Haven area in the Bronx. I was unemployed, collecting welfare. Then I got a break that led me off welfare and into the middle class. I got a job with waste management and became a member of Labor's Local 108. When I started with the union 21 years ago, I was making $5 an hour. Today I am making $23 an hour with benefits that provide my family and I health care and retirement security. Thanks to my union job, I was able to buy my first home in the Thrives section of the Bronx. I used my union annuity fund to put down the deposit for the new home. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I know what income inequity is. We must protect middle class jobs, especially now when the city continues to create low wage sector jobs. I am confident the city council can achieve both waste equity and protect good quality jobs like the one that I have. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Kendall? Good afternoon, Chairman Renoso and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Kendall Christensen. I'm here as Executive Director of New Yorkers for Responsible Waste Management, which is a, an organization of locally owned and operated waste service companies that provide comprehensive collection, processing, and disposal services for the waste, recyclables, and organics generated by New York City's businesses. I have two statements uh, to submit. One is on behalf of High Tech uh, uh, Resource Recovery, which is a transfer station and recycling facility in North Brooklyn. And the second is on behalf of New Yorkers for Responsible Waste Management. My testimony is organized as a series of questions, much like those that you and Councilmember Levin asked of the commissioner. Um, the only point I would make as I encourage you to look at those questions for the committee to consider is that um, the Department of Sanitation should be required by the committee to do a full-blown environmental impact statement of the impact of Intro 157. We are aware that they've done a partial environmental assessment uh, review, uh, but we uh, think that that should be turned into a full-blown EIS, including the opportunity for public comment, stakeholder comment, similar to what would be required if this was an update to the city's solid waste management plan. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Kendall. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman uh, Steve Changaris, I'm the New York City Chapter Director for the National Waste and Recycling Association. 
50-year-old trade group for the America's private waste and recycling industry. We represent, we have many members who own these facilities who collect the trash who are the subject of the hearing today. Um, I've submitted the testimony that, uh, for the record, making sure we cover all the points, but I just want to go over some of the, the bigger uh, talking points and issues that are in that testimony for your review. Um, we're here because of, uh, you know, we own these facilities and the Carters use these facilities and they are, you know, service their communities, they, they do this for their families, they do this for their businesses and their companies and it's uh, important work and uh, day in and day out. Um, we believe that uh, the 157B uh, has, um, is, is, is not the best or appropriate way to address transfer station capacity uh, reduction that was envisioned in the Solid Waste Management Plan. It's, it's outside the scope of the environmental assessment and the state regulatory and planning process with CEQA and the City Solid Waste Review, or rather a facility planning review. And, you know, I think if you listen to the, 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 the line of questioning with the committee today, there was this sense that you're, you're asking the department and the commissioner and you're talking amongst yourselves that, we, we, well, this isn't going to hurt, this is going to work out, these are going to accommodate all these various um, needs that the planning process anticipates. And I would submit that it, it doesn't. And I know it's well-meaning and I know it's the intent of the legislature to, to move this bill, but the proper way to address this issue is through the planning process and to make sure that the environmental assessment and the environmental impact statements are done. Um, the, um, the other issues in here, um, let's see, uh, we know uh, that, that process is delineated uh, in the July, and it's in the record, we submitted it as an attachment, in the July letter from intro 495 from last year. It's a, it's a thorough analysis of why we believe there's a full-blown environmental assessment needed that leads to the environmental impact statement. And in addition to that, um, we have foiled the environmental assessment and we've gotten, uh, it's not available, it's not ready. One of the other things that we would we submit in the testimony is that if, if we, those reviews were done, the very kinds of questions that you asked the commissioner, all that would be modeled and understood. All those impacts would be understood. One of the big questions in the testimony is that you, you say, well, because we're only reducing it a little bit and we're doing this and no one's going to get more, we're under capacity. The bottom line is nobody knows where those trucks are going to go and where that waste is going to go because it hasn't been modeled and it hasn't been studied thoroughly by the council. That's why there's that planning process in CEQA that we have a swamp process and, and, and all that in, uh, well thought out and well reasoned kind of process. So uh, if I might, you know, it's a jobs bill. This, this, uh, you say, well, you take away capacity, it's a small amount, the station's going to survive. That's an that's a, um, unknown thought. You, it could be the critical mass that causes that station to close and then uh, uh, the permit's surrendered and the waste goes elsewhere. So the, all the testimony, all the points are in there. Uh, we'll continue to work with you as best we can and we think there's better ways to get this done. Thank you for your testimony. And I just want to make mention, you're the wa waste management in the Bronx? You work in waste management in the Bronx? When I started in the facility, it was oh. owned by waste management. Oh. They moved to the Harlem River Yard oh. after that. So now you're in the Harlem River Yard? No, now I work for Action Carding. Oh, so you work and for Action And 132nd in the Bronx. Okay. Does uh, the Action Carding, do you have a rail facility there? Um, there was. It was removed. Okay. At the end of our property, it begins. It goes through New York Post into Waste Management Facility. So what we're trying to do um, in both cases with Waste Management and Action Carding, if there is a rail, we want to exempt those, those type of locations. We think what we're trying to do is we move trucks off the street. So if you come in a regular truck, you dump your garbage, and then we can move that garbage to rail, and the rail takes it to wherever it has to go, or a barge, which is the, like the boat. Uh, we have that, access for barging and for rail on our so, property. So we're trying to exempt those facilities that, that have rail. Um, we're trying to see if we can expand recycling. So if they're changing from straight petrusible to some recycling, we're also going to give them 20% increases. So I just want you to know that in the work that we did, we paid attention to um, what we consider good players, of which action carding and waste management are both players that we think do well by their workers. As you can see, you guys have good employment. You have good pay. Um, you know, they're not giving you 18-hour work days no. um, unless you ask for it, um, which is illegal, actually. So, no, they're not giving you 18-hour work days. Um, so my point being is that what we want to do is figure out a way to keep supporting the action cardings and the waste management, um, but 
eliminating the sanitation salvages of the world. And you are not sanitation salvaged no. by any way, shape, or mean. And I hope that everyone in this room has read the ProPublica articles, all three of them. Um, I want to give a shout out to Kira Feldman for the work that she did in finally highlighting in a real way the atrocities that are going on to people that don't have unions representing them. Um, I think we're, you're privileged to be able to have a job where you do, where you have a union representing you that's real. Um, a lot of other workers don't. So we're trying to figure that out. And this is a first step in trying to make that happen. Um, I also know that NIRM has uh, organizations that they represent that are part of that group of good players. Uh, but we wanted to make sure that the bad players get held accountable. And until we don't start pushing this legislation, we're not gonna be able to do any of that. So I wanna thank you for your time here. Um, you. I know you are in opposition, but I'm letting you know that uh, I'm not in opposition to the work that you're doing and I don't want you to lose your jobs. We've done everything we can to talk to waste management, to talk to action carding, to make sure that we, we do the best we can to protect good players. And you could ask them about that. And Chairman, we just want to be clear, the opposition comes from the possible display workers at the waste transfer station. Our opposition does not have to do anything with waste equity. Like I said, our members live in the five boroughs. They have families and they sustain families. And a lot of them actually live in the overburden district. So we can definitely we, we can definitely come to a compromise when it comes to this bill and protecting quality jobs like the ones our work our workers have. So we'll, we'll continue, and we'll continue to have a conversation, and I wanna make sure that that's the hard part of what we're trying to do here. We have an issue with environmental injustices, cool. with um, uh, asthma rates and the trucks polluting the streets of only very small specific communities, and then we have the jobs that come with that, that type of job. So to find that balance is very difficult. That's why we have, you know, originally the bill said 50% across the city of New York. Now we lowered it in the Bronx and Queens. There were no rail exemptions. There were no recycling exemptions in the past, and we added those two to this bill. We're constantly trying to modify it so that we can make it something that's fair and balanced, but we could bring environmental justice while preserving good jobs. So that is something that we're trying to do every single day. Um, and I know that you, you care deeply about the jobs part, but um, I'm trying to find a balance because I represent those, that community that's being hurt, and I can't just look at that one part. I have to look at a comprehensive um, uh, initiative, I guess, or, or push. So again, I just want to say that I'm looking forward to when we pass this legislation, we can start moving forward and fighting on the same side again like we usually do. So thank you for your time and your testimony. And I just want to thank all the members of the laborers that are here today um, showing up. So I really appreciate you guys taking the time to be here fighting for something that's important to you. Mr. Chairman, I want to have a oh yes, Council Member Cabrera from the Bronx. I thought you had forgot me, Mr. Chairman. BX, I'm sorry, bro. Maybe because I'm not for the bill. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I'm okay with that. I'll give you five minutes if you want. Five minutes. No, I, I won't need that much time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this very important hearing because I know this. there are many signs to this issue. I just want to let, I wanted to be on the record that I fully support uh, the, the companies here and all of the laborers. Uh, many of the laborers that are working uh, and these companies, uh, they were given an exceptional uh, opportunities, an opportunity to hear some of the stories. And I commend you, you have your, your own home now, your own house in Throxnick, uh, and the stories, uh, I'm sure if we were to give an opportunity to many people uh, here uh, will be replicated. My, one of my biggest concerns, number one, we have for a lot of these businesses, I invested literally hundreds and thousands and thousands of dollars, and now to be asked to do something that is gonna affect their business, I'm, I'm always leery about that. Second, in terms of employment. Third, what you just mentioned, the environmental impact. Uh, I, I fully support it. I think that is something that we should have a greater discussion about. Uh, it amazes me that there's, there seems to be a solidarity among the coalition of, of the businesses involved here, and I, I'm, I'm not satisfied yet uh, that we have reached, uh, as I was, it was stated by the Mason Tenders Union, I'm so glad that you're here, uh, that there has been a, a compromise that at the end of the day, it makes sense. I'm hoping that 
um, that at the end of the day, it will be a win-win situation. We're not there. I, I really believe that we're not there, and I know some of the other members of this committee, uh, they're uh, not with that. So we will continue the discussion. Do know you have my support. Thank you so much. I see, oh, he's back. Thank you, and I didn't use the five minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilmember Cabrera. Justin Wood, James Kerbian, Dior Doward, Reverend Dan Rodriguez, and Dr. Cape Collins. This is five, one, two, three, four, five. All right, I think we lost one. Justin, we're gonna start with you and then move left. All right. Sure, thank you, Chair Reynoso and uh, members of the committee. So I'm Justin Wood. I'm the Director of Organizing and Strategic Research at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. And a lot of the uh, arguments about why this is a very necessary and overdue bill. Um, many of us remember being here, I think it was four years ago, and even before that, there were previous versions of this bill. Um, so I'm not going to make those arguments again, but I do want to because I spend a lot of time looking at the facts and want to try to make sure we stick to facts in this conversation um, to correct some of the misinformation that we're hearing from the for-profit waste industry. Um, and I have, they didn't really deliver it, but I have copies of, of Mr. Toscano's uh, testimony and the so-called New Yorkers for Responsible Waste Management here. Um, so in the many years since you, Council uh, Chair Reynoso, and your predecessors uh, in the council have been fighting for waste equity to just make this gross inequality a little bit better, We've had a chance to see how things will work out if we just leave it alone and don't pass this bill. And things are getting worse on a number of fronts, not better. And those are the facts. So in Southeast Queens, where we've had a marine transfer station, um, thankfully, taking Department of Sanitation Waste for a number of years now, and that's a good thing. We want those trucks going there, and we want those good union jobs at that marine transfer station. We want that waste going out by barge. Southeast Queens has actually had a, a big increase in the amount of waste being trucked into that environmental justice community by the private companies. So we can't just leave it alone. We desperately need this legislation. I also want to highlight the direction that recycling has gone in. Um, we're fully on the side uh, of workers represented by the laborers, Teamsters, and other legitimate unions. We're also really aware that recycling and organics processing, recycling the huge amount of our waste stream that's organics, creates five to 20 times more good green jobs than simply trucking this waste in and out of environmental justice communities to landfills. Unfortunately, the private waste industry is going in exactly the wrong direction with it, recycling. We just fi finished adding up all of this year's uh, just submitted signed sworn statements that the uh, transfer station owners submitted to the state DEC, and they actually, even with these new business recycling rules that the commissioner talked about enforcing, private waste transfer stations trucked 200,000 more tons to landfills in upstate New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Virginia, other environmental justice communities in other states than they did in 2016. So that's with the new rules. Things got worse on recycling, and that means we're leaving a huge opportunity for green job creation um, on the table. Organics, the private transfer stations haven't made those investments. They're barely doing any organics. It's like less than 1% of that food waste is being recovered. Again, we know there are issues with recycling markets in China that explain some of why they're not marketing their material. Last I checked, we weren't marketing organics to China. We can do that right here and create jobs right here. And this bill correctly has an exemption for creating those kinds of recycling and organics operations. Um, so I'll stop there and we'll submit some written testimony, but just wanted to take a chance to, to correct the record on, on some of these issues about job creation and recycling. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Make sure you hit, make sure the, the red button is on when you click it. There you go. Good afternoon. My name is James Kerbeam. I'm here to represent the 
Teamsters Union, Local 813, the Private Sanitation Union in this city, and also President and Business Manager Sean Campbell. I'd like to first off thank this council for allowing me to testify for my union today. The Teamsters Local Unions represent thousands of New York City workers in this industry, including the Department of Sanitation workers, private carting, construction, and demolition workers, transfer station workers, and recycling workers. We want every job in this industry to be a good job. That means safe jobs, dignified jobs, and also a family sustaining job, and jobs that can, our workers can retire from with security. Most private transfer station workers that work in this industry have to toll and unacceptable working conditions with low pay, with uh, few prospects. Recent media coverage has exposed how many sanitation companies treat their workers that operate garbage trucks. Think about how they treat workers that work in the transfer station now, that they can actually house and hide from the public eye. You, may, you heard today from other folks that testified that this will cause union jobs. They will be lost. That's a joke to most workers in this industry because of the sham unions that you have talked about, Council Member Reynoso. Sanitation Salvage, Mr. T, Five Star, Borough Wide, Liberty Ash, and many more use these sham unions. And these sham unions I call out today, Life 890, Rise 124, United Service Workers, Local 339, and there are more out there that pops up on a daily basis. They, pro they protect the employers, not the workers. The gold standard transfer stations are the Department of Sanitation Marine stations. Safety is the priority. Workers have a Teamster contract they are, that they are paid a fair wage and have good health care and pension benefits. Most of all, they are treated with respect. They are treated like humans. When those facilities were announced as a part of the solid waste management plan, the whole point was to stop this send of all the trash to the privately owned facilities that often mistreat their workers and the communities around them. This waste equity legislation will be protection for the South Bronx, North Brooklyn, and Southeast Queens, which have been dumped on for way too long. The Teamsters care about the environment and the justice because of our members do not just work in these communities, but they live there too. Our kids deserve a better future. The Teamsters is in full support of Bill in Intro 157B, and we encourage this council to vote yes for it. Thank you for your testimony. Good afternoon. Um, so I just wanted to just kind of preface my, my testimony um, with this idea that thank you for speaking about workers and laborers. One of the things that we want to do is have a large investment in worker-owned cooperatives because we believe that that is the way that we'll be able to support this new plan moving forward with um, community members that actually represent EJ communities. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Dior Dowett, and I am the founder of Green Fiend, which is a Bronx-based environmental consulting firm that uses hip-hop to teach sustainability through compost education and green technology. And so at Green Fiend, we adopt the principles of environmental justice and have recently started a worker-owned cooperative designed to process organic waste locally. Greenfield Organics is a graduate of Green Workers Cooperative located in the South Bronx, and our goal is to collect and process organics locally to ignite community-based solutions that secure waste equity for Bronx residents. Greenfield envisions a society where resources and benefits are equally shared and where people play a role in community decision-making in proportion to the degree they are affected. We are fighting for a South Bronx where future generations have clean air, well-resourced and community-controlled schools, safe streets, green space, good jobs, and more control over the wealth that their labor actually creates, which is why we started a worker-owned cooperative. Sometimes inspiring changes comes without reward or recognition. And so the South Bronx has long dealt with an unfair share of the city's garbage, from truck traffic to the smells to the noise of the transportations. Our community is forced to live within the toxic burden caused by all five boroughs, and as we know, as a result of racial zoning, that is why that has happened. 
That is why as a Bronx resident, I took the class with the Green Workers Cooperative because I shared similar goals of green development. So it's time for the city to step up and take measures that would protect the Bronx from any more garbage. We support Intro 157 and see it as a part of a larger vision for an equitable waste system that does not put all the burden on just a few low-income communities and communities of color. The disproportionate numbers of waste transfer stations in the South Bronx is an EJ issue that community members and stakeholders are trying to overturn, which is why I keep talking about worker-owned cooperatives. Grassroots organizing presents its own set of challenges like finding commonality among national groups with different frameworks. However, this bill allows us to practice engaging in an alternative system where our collective interests are represented in different ways. I'll leave you with a rhyme for the time because we do our hip hop. So we send jobs to other states when we export our waste. So it's time to raise the stakes and pass 157A, I know it's B now. <laughs> Let's keep the food out the trash and make them rats mad. If we don't feed them, we won't need them. Compost my liberation to some freedom. Thank you. Thank you, good job. We are clap for that. I know. <laughs> so when, and I just wanted to ask a quick question. Yes. Worker, you're saying that you through a cooperative, it's yes. like the workers owning yes. transfer stations. The workers would be owning the waste, the actually waste management company. Okay. Yes. And, that they, and, that and they our have focus a stake is in the specifically company. organics from the beginning. All right. So they yes. would have a stake in the company. I yes. Hundred percent. All right. Thank you for that. <laughs> I appreciate you. that. I haven't thought about. I haven't heard that yet. So yes. thank you to Green Fiend. Yes. <laughs> Good day, distinguished panel. I'm Reverend Daniel Rodriguez from the. Greater Allen AME Cathedral in Jamaica, Queens. I'm here today as part of a collaborative team of concerned civic community, clergy, council, and corporate members of this fine city. I join in the hopes of bringing some measure of beneficial accountability and waste equity to the practices of an industry that is, if left unchecked, can prove to be health challenging to the communities impacted. Intro 157 is responsible legislation and a collaborative effort developed to protect overburdened low-income communities of color receiving, um, of receiving any more trash. It seeks to reduce the amount of garbage permitted in these communities of the city, which includes the South Bronx, North Brooklyn, and Southeast Queens, while capping the amount of garbage that can be uh, processed in all other community districts in the city. It's a compromising bill that doesn't say not in my backyard, but instead says not all in my backyard. It also incentivizes the transfer stations to recycle more, which provides an opportunity to create more and better jobs while encouraging the use of barge and rail transport for the moving of trash out of the city as opposed to using more diesel long haul trucks, which if implemented would help our kids breathe clean air. We have an opportunity today to carry each other's burdens so that all involved can become better citizens of the neighborhoods in which we work, live, and serve. And I pray that we do. Thank you. We should have called you a long time ago, Reverend. You make some great statements. Can you repeat that one that you said? Is that we don't want to get rid of all waste. We just want to get rid of some waste. What is it? How did you say it? <laughs> It's a compromising bill that does not say not in my backyard, but instead says not all in my backyard. All right. Thank you for that. I like that. I'm going to steal it. I'm telling you now. Okay. Well, I borrowed it from William Baker. <laughs> okay. So thank you, William Baker. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for the uh, opportunity to speak. Thank you to the council. My name is uh, Dr. Cappy Collins. I'm a pediatrician, and I work with families in East Harlem. Air quality is a major factor affecting the health of children, especially in communities beset with disproportionate burdens of traffic and poor housing and poverty, and East Harlem is one of those communities. The parents I work with are doing what they can to preserve the health of their children. Asthma is a big problem, with higher rates in East Harlem than almost anywhere in the country. Parents can take care of doctor's appointments, keeping up with medications, that's within their power. They cannot control the garbage trucks, idling on the streets, crisscrossing the streets, and barreling up the avenues as they haul thousands of tons of waste per day through their neighborhood en route to disposal sites in other impoverished neighborhoods in the South Bronx. 
Combustion exhaust contains hydrocarbons, soot, ozone, and carcinogenic chemicals like benzene and makes asthma worse. I can't prescribe a medication for this. And families can't protect themselves from the polluted air they breathe. We need help. And help is at hand. As a community of New Yorkers, we can make the air better through legislation. Limiting the maximum capacity at our waste transfer stations is a first step towards clean air. I urge the council to support Intro 157 and continue building a just city that allows children and families to thrive. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that testimony from a pediatrician. Um, just to the health effects, a lot of people, I don't think, they take it for granted. I just have, I have recently have a newborn baby. And when I walk outside now, when I walk outside now, I think about it completely differently. I think about all the trucks. I cross streets differently. I don't want, I don't go down major thoroughways because I think he's going to breathe all that air in. Um, I didn't notice that before. Now I notice it every second. So I appreciate you coming out and making that testimony and, and being here. And then I just want to say to the Teamsters, I try to push a law that would make it illegal to have these fake unions, that you needed to do more to show that you're a union than, than what they were doing, and like, like the life, life 890. But it's a state issue. So I don't have the authority as a council member to modify that law. If I would, if I did, I would try to change it, and I would be the first person on that bill just to let you know that that's a big problem that we're going to deal with long term here, all these fake unions coming in. Um, and being able to have the same footing as, as you or the laborers. So we got to start working on that as well. Um, I'm more than happy to join a campaign in the, in the state to, to make that happen, to modify that legislation. So I appreciate everyone for their time. Um, and we're going to the next panel. Thank you. Rolando Guzman, Stephanie Wenzel, Omar Friella. Danny Peralta and Priya Morgana Carr. I tried, Priya. I'm sorry. I'm terrible. We need to get. So, Orlando, we're going to start with you and go down as well. Hi, um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rolando Guzman, and I'm the uh, Deputy Director for Community Preservation at St. Nick's Alliance. Uh, I'm here testifying on behalf of a coalition of uh, uh, organizations in North Brooklyn that came together uh, after the um, whole environmental um, injustice of the opening of so many waste transfer stations in our community. We are here supporting this legislation right now. Uh, we believe this is uh, not only right, but it's a great message for other communities that is going to prevent other communities of color uh, of ending up like North Brooklyn. North Brooklyn, uh, as it is right now, is an environmental tragedy. We have an oil spill that is the largest in the Northeast of the United States. We process almost 40% of New York City garbage. Um, our kids are elementary school playgrounds are pretty much next to track routes. We have one of the highest rates of asthma in the whole city, and, um, ten, and neighbors complain about sound, uh, the noise, about the lack of uh, air quality, uh, about traffic safety issues. Um, I just want to say something to the people from the trade, the, uh, the, the second panel that happened here, and I would like them to come uh, and the message is clear, just bring your kids to North Brooklyn, just bring them to the South Bronx, just have them stopping for half an hour in a stop, in, a, in a, any corner where those trucks are going, and just take them home and see how that goes. Uh, I, I think this is a clear message. This is, uh, we're, we're trying to have a, a, to end the tale of two cities. And uh, you just go from Manhattan, you just go to subway rides, to other communities where you have a total different environment. And uh, we think that's enough is enough. I think uh, this legislation as it is right now is going to prevent and is going to support those transfer stations that are trying to do the 
business right and responsible, but it's also sending a clear message to those lousy, irresponsible transfer stations that they are going to be shut down. And either you have to comply or you are out of business. But uh, the reality is that this legislation is actually going to ensure that good neighbors, good business, good transfer stations stay open. We increase the recycling, but at the same time getting rid of the transfer stations that are a harm to our community. I just want to thank again uh, Council Member Reynoso, Council Member Steve Levin for being our champions in this. Uh, I think this is uh, uh, when the mayor came to, uh, to North Brooklyn last fall, we were very happy when the city committed to have this pass. And uh, in, in, on behalf of North Brooklyn, we are really looking forward to this legislation to be our law. Thank you. Thank you, Rolando. Um, hi, my name is Stephanie Wenzel. Um, I was born in Brooklyn, and I've been a resident of East Williamsburg, Brooklyn since 1997 on Barrett Street. Um, <laughs> my council member is Antonio, Antonio Reynoso, and I'm very proud to see him here today rep representing our district. Uh, my son is now a pre-K student at PS 147, which I should mention is the School for Environmental Engineering, and I am an artist who works with the students at the school um, on art projects related to environmental sustainability. Um, our zone school, this zone school, is three blocks away from our home, which we love. Uh, the park that we visit every day after school, one block down from PS 147, is adjacent to a cement factory, which currently does not miss down its cement dust. The air quality is compromised for not only my son, but the entire community around Gilbert Ramirez Park. PS 147, the Young Women's Leadership School, which shares the same building as PS 147, residents around the Morgan Stop and Montrose Stops on the L train and beyond. In addition, we have a waste transfer sta station, which was mentioned in the video that you saw earlier. And in addition to a slew of waste transfer trucks that park overnight on every green avenue, right next to PS 257 and the baseball and playground that students and residents frequent. Not only is it the particulates that are unsafe from these trucks to our health, but it is the routes in which these trucks take um, that are not actually truck routes and additionally compromise our safety. Cement trucks cruise down McKibben and take a right onto left, right or left onto Bushwick Avenue, which is not an approved truck route with little to no regard for the pedestrians trying to cross the street simply to get to school. This is also in, in addition to the waste transfer um, trucks. This is just a snapshot of my neighborhood, but I am here to represent the larger community of North Brooklyn, as well as um, uh, that is overrun, overrun and overburdened by too much carting. North Brooklyn has 19 waste transfer stations of the total 58 citywide. So that means we're carrying 33% of the total load in one concentrated area. It's unfair, it's unsafe, it's unhealthy. And I'm just here to testify that I love my community and I would love to see it thrive, and all of us in North Brooklyn deserve a healthy and safe environment in which to do that. Thanks. We're gonna, um, one of my staff members is gonna come see you in a few. We wanna take your contact information down as well, even though I think I have it, but just in case we don't. Um, we're actually doing something on the uh, cement side, on the concrete side, and I wanna know if you would be willing to help us or join. Oh yeah, totally. um, We have something that we're trying to do there, because again, I can't regulate uh, the cement industry, uh, but, there's something else we can do, so we'll be reaching out to you on that part. But okay. thank you for your testimony here today. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Reynoso and Councilman Levin. Um, I want to thank you for, for the, having, the op being, having the opportunity to be here. My name is Omar Freya. I'm the founder and coordinator of Green Worker Cooperatives. We're a South Bronx-based organization uh, in Hunts Point. I myself have lived, grown up in the South Bronx, and we live and, and, and work uh, now, in Hunts Point, it's been 18 years. Uh, about 15 years ago, I started our organization, Green Worker Cooperatives, really motivated by the subject of this, this hearing. Um, our work is about helping people to start up worker cooperatives. So just the kind of work that Dior mentioned from Green Fiend, you know, our focus is about helping people who have ideas, who want to create a green business, do it in a way that empowers workers, keeps money in the neighborhood, and has everyone has a say 
you know, that as a worker-owned business. And that is something that we help people to do. And it was inspired and created because I had a long history just being in the community and seeing and hearing these arguments all the time, being in situations like this where it's this idea that the environment and our health and our safety is at odds with jobs. And people always ask, well, if we don't, if we don't get, if, if you're saying that these companies are bad, then what else is there? You know, what are the options? And too, too often for too long, we've been put in this position, and being that we're, in, we're poor, a poor community, that we get put into this position where we're expected to take whatever job is thrown at us from whatever business owner whose really only motivation is to get as much money as they can out of their business and have no regard for the, for the workers that are there and the community that's surrounding them. So that's why we're about creating businesses where people actually have a say and they own the business. And if you do that, then you're, you're, you take more care not just of the work uh, of the business itself, but the community that the business is a part of. You don't gash your own neighborhoods. You don't, you don't run roughshod over the community that you live in because you hear it, you hear from people all the time, unless you're being forced to by the owners of the business. So for us, this is why it's really important to create opportunities where we restrict the negatives and emphasize and create opportunities for the positive work. So the work of Green Fiend and creating composting, um, we've got a number of of worker-owned businesses that are all doing different kinds of work. They're artisans who are recycling and creating, creating opportunities out of, out of crafts. Uh, others that are doing composting like Green Fiend and others. And it's, it's really exciting and, and we're thankful that the city has been supportive of the worker co-op initiative in doing that. And we, see, we are, want to see and are creating more opportunities in every sector and want to be able to have opportunities where we can create jobs for people in doing this kind of work and move beyond this idea that we, can ex we have to take whatever there is on the argument of the owners that you know, there is no other option. We've got, we've got lots of options and we're creating them ourselves. Thank you. I really appreciate the Bronx being here too, by the way. We need as much support from the Bronx as possible. There's a lot of love in Brooklyn for this legislation, not so much in the Bronx. So anything that you could mm -hmm. do to help us you know, get some folks convinced to support this bill would be helpful. Yeah, no, we, we have a lot of politicians who buy into a fake argument. All right, appreciate that. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Danny Peralta, and I represent the Point Community Development Corporation based out of Hunts Point. Um, for the last uh, 20 years, our organization has been uh, dedicated to youth development um, and the economic revitalization of the Hunts Point uh, community primarily with our youth work and our cultural work. Uh, we have also been very active um, in our env environmental justice movement um, with our community. Um, you know, we are one of the most, obviously we keep talking about it, one of the most uh, environmentally overburdened districts in the community, um, in all of New York City. Um, the biggest contributors, obviously, to this uh, is, is the pollution that comes from the waste industry, right? Um, our commercial, our, excuse me, our community handles roughly 40% of the city's waste, which we spoke about already. Um, and obviously, a lot of the respiratory illnesses, asthma, are all related to this uh, particular matter 2.0 pollution, you know, still. Um, in 2016, uh, we did a study with our young people where we stood on the corner um, for a couple of hours at a time, and we recorded an average of about 304 commercial trucks per hour. That's one every 24 seconds coming into our neighborhood, moving around our neighborhood, um, where we have largely residents and young people. Um, our also, our violence is also measured um, that the ground level asthma inducing uh, the particular matter 2.5 is of 5% higher than the average for the area, just in this immediate time. Um, obviously, you know, the dangers of the, of the industry go beyond the pollution. Um, we spoke a little bit about a sanitation salvage, who is our, you know, uh, unfortunately one of our neighbors a couple blocks away, um, and the, the deaths, the tragic deaths of Mark Tour Diallo, as well as Leon Clark, um, by, by, the, by the hands of, of one of the drivers. Um, again, something that is not new to us, something that we're still dealing with. Um, you know, we feel like intro 157 is long overdue, obviously. Um, and it's something that, again, will hopefully help um, take the overburdened districts of our communities um, of, of wasting, of processing the waste um, at such a high level. Um, and we also see that it is, again, a road to something that a little bit uh, changes, uh, similar to some of the things that some of the colleagues spoke. I want to um, just kind of step away from this um, piece right now and just, and just speak you know, again, a little bit about that, that narrative that we keep hearing, um, that this is about uh, residents versus employees um, and an industry, which is obviously very false. 
Um, we're not here um, representing that. We're here representing all people. We know that the workers that come to these communities and work in these spaces, again, they do represent our community as well. So we're not against that. Uh, we just don't want um, to deal again with this overburden. Um, we also want to, um, you know, I just want to make a plea um, out here as well. Um, I know that you said the Bronx is not represented very well um, and this piece particularly, our officials have, have kind of stepped away from this uh, for sure. Um, and we want to make sure that again, you know, as somebody who um, I've done youth development work for over 20 years now, if folks feel like they need their hand held in this uh, situation, please send them my way. I will help support them um, in this time when they need that extra push um, to make the right decision. Not only for, for our community, but for themselves. I know some of them actually live in our community. Um, and again, let's just change this narrative. Let's stop sitting here and talking about the Bronx like it's a third world country. Let's actually do something one positive for our, for our community finally, and let's actually make the changes that we know that we have the solutions for for many, many years. Let's, let's make that happen finally, please. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I just want to just acknowledge the fact that the point has been in the front lines of this for a long time, and you guys have never wavered at all. You're willing to go to war with anybody to make sure that the Bronx is taken care of, and I saw that, and I really appreciate that because there's a lot of organizations that got to look out for their necks, and you guys are willing to take a chance and fight for environmental justice and for your community over everything, so I appreciate that. And we never do it alone. I just want to make sure that folks realize that. That is not done by ourselves. We have a lot of great partners in this work as well. Thank you. I appreciate that. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and for saying my last name. You did great. Uh, my name is Priya Mulgaukar, and I'm here on behalf of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. Founded in 1991, NIJA is a nonprofit citywide membership network linking grassroots organizations from low income communities and communities of color in their struggle for environmental justice. Proud to be here with one of our members, The Point, El Puente Tosavet earlier, and a lot of our allies in the room. Um, for decades, NIJA has led efforts for comprehensive policy reforms to address the disproportionate burden of New York's solid waste system on a handful of environmental justice communities. New York City creates roughly 23,000 tons of trash every day. Garbage trucks travel needlessly thousands of miles throughout the city, polluting our air with diesel fuel, clogging our streets, and diminishing our quality of life. These impacts are greatest, as has been mentioned many times, in those few low-income communities and communities of color where truck-dependent transfer stations are clustered. Not surprisingly, these same communities deal with many sources of pollution and the negative health out, uh, outcomes thereof, such as asthma, heart disease, and cancer. NIJA has long advocated for the city to help reduce tra truck traffic in our communities by cutting the amount of waste sent to private land-based waste transfer facilities. Currently, over 60% of citywide waste throughput is handled in just four community districts in North Brooklyn, the South Bronx, and Southeast Queens. And although the Department of Sanitation has taken steps to shift residential waste export to the three operational city-owned export facilities, the marine transfer stations in the North Shore of Queens, uh, the Hamilton Marine Transfer Station in Brooklyn, and the Staten Island Rail Transfer Station. Um, these are important steps to reducing vehicle traffic and pollution in EJ communities. But at the same time, still about 75% of commercial waste still ends up in the truck intensive facilities, uh, many of which hold permits, as has been mentioned before, that would allow uh, them to nearly double their waste throughput. The toxic impacts of these facilities are well documented and have been um, testified by many of our members and colleagues. So I will just say that Intro 157 is a critical first step to addressing the longstanding environmental racism by the commercial waste industry. The bill alone is not a cure-all. It will help, however, to cut the permitted capacity at facilities located in overburdened communities and protect these communities and other low-income communities of color from handling any more waste in the future. NIJA hopes that this protective bill will help spur the future policies that will truly address waste equity, such as requiring that commercial waste be diverted to the city-owned marine and rail transfer stations, and that the commercial waste zones will require higher standards for land-based facilities to reduce impacts on communities and the environment. Thank you, Chair Reynoso and Councilmember Levin for your commitment to advancing waste equity and for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your work, and you need to talk to uh, Green Fiend and, and uh, the Green Worker Cooperatives to join NIJA as well. We're, you guys we're need working to on it. Fight. We, need <laughs> a, we need to be united. That's an important thing that, um, uh, that if we're all together fighting for the same cause, it's easier for us to make this stuff happen. We can't leave people out there on their own trying to figure this out. But I want to thank you 
um, for coming and, and for the panel for testifying. So thank you. Appreciate it. And Mr. Chair, I just want to correct the record. Earlier in my introductory remarks, I said Coalition for Environmental Justice as a glaring mistake. It's, uh, I meant Nija. So thanks. I think they'll live with that, though. They'll be okay. <laughs> I got two angry texts about that. Two angry. <laughs> Um, Alison Cordero um, stepped out, but she did submit uh, testimony. Yeah, she, she submitted testimony. Eric Goldstein from NRDC. Michael Heimbendy. There you go. Thank you for that. You guys all have to help me. I want people to start signing their names phonetically. Jana Corliss or Jeanette Corliss. And Eric Rosatis. Where's Eric? There he is. So Eric, we start with you. Okay. Uh oh, no, wait. Okay, yes, do we do start? Either way. Whoever's whoever's furthest right from uh, uh, my uh, right side is gonna okay. start. There you go. Good afternoon, committee chair. Kidding. There we go. Take two. Uh good afternoon, uh committee chair Reynoso. Um uh, Chief and Prime Sponsor, is, is, is Levin still here? Hello, hello, and members of the committee. Uh, huge thanks for allowing me the time and opportunity to testify before you today. Uh, my name is Janelle Corliss, and I am the Legislative Campaigns Manager for New York Working Families. Uh, my apologies in appropriating the laborers orange today. Obviously, that was not intentional. And I'm actually going to provide um, testimony on behalf of my principal, Stefan Edel, who's the project director over at New York Working Families today. Um, so um, working families, we stand in complete solidarity with the environmental justice, labor, community, and public health advocates in support of Intro 157 today a bill that will provide meaningful relief to communities that have shouldered the burden of handling far more than their fair share of the city's waste for way too long. Working Families is deeply committed to fighting for a city that works for all New Yorkers across race, class, ethnicity, and geographic location. To that end, an essential part of this is a solid waste management system that treats all New Yorkers fairly, that protects our communities from unnecessary or uh, excessive environmental harms while also uh, rewarding industry actors that treat their workers and their neighbors well. In that regard, we have much work to do to make that goal a reality. It is disturbing that we have created a system in which just three communities, overwhelmingly working class and of color, are still home to upwards of three-fourths three of the city's private waste transfer station capacity and handle over 15,000 tons of garbage every day. Residents of these, these communities are subject to bad neighbor facilities and an endless stream of diesel trucks that pollute their air, clog their streets, and diminish their quality of life. This is a gross inequity that demands a remedy. Another aligned effort that complements this one is the city's exploration of how to implement an exclusive zoned franchise for commercial waste collections. Exclusive and rational zones and contracts with a single hauler in each zone selected through a transparent bidding process will reduce the number of truck trips, improve contracting and regulation, improve safety for workers in our communities, and open the doors for innovation. Zoning creates incentives for investments that are needed to achieve high diversion rates and therefore less burden on communities that host waste transfer processing. Intro 157 provides concrete relief to these communities by making modest reductions to the permitted capacity of transfer stations in the most impacted neighborhoods. This will take trucks off the roads in these communities without the city's ability to meet its solid waste management needs. By timing the reductions to occur after the city's cleaner, safer, and more modern marine and rail-based transfer stations become operational, Intro 157A ensures that there is ample capacity to achieve reductions. So in conclusion, just want to say that waste equity is a critical first step to transforming the entire commercial waste system from a polluting, inefficient system that exploit workers in low-income communities to a fairer, more sustainable system. For these reasons, working families 
firmly supports Intro 157 and strongly urges the council to pass it. Thank you. Thank you, Janelle. Appreciate it. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Reynoso, Council Member Levin. Uh, my name is Eric Brzezidis. I am a member of the Outrage Steering Committee. I'm also the chair of the Community Board One, Brooklyn Community Board One Transportation Committee. Uh, I want to thank you very much for holding this hearing and allowing me to testify today. I would also like to thank the co-sponsors, the 19 co-sponsors of this bill, uh, as well as um, <clears throat> uh, the other members of the committee. And I, I hope that we can uh, get uh, Councilmember Cabrera to come, come along and bring his, his group with them as well. Um, I'm very happy to see uh, this bill reintroduced and give you my unmitigated support for it. Um, we had hoped to have this passed in the past, but we're happy to see it moving forward. With 19 co-sponsors, I hope that means that uh, with uh, a third of the council for it, um, that we can carry it over the, over the goalpost. A um, couple comments uh, about uh, truck traffic. Um, truck traffic in North Brooklyn, um, as the chair is aware, we see about 5,000 truck trips a day. 50% of those are waste haulers. Many of those trucks are off route. Um, we are expected to see an additional 200 plus um, with the expansion of the organics program that will be going to the waste, uh, to the water treatment plant. Um, we also have an enormous number, a uh, larger number of construction and demolition uh, trucks that are hauling now because of the incredible growth uh, in North Brooklyn, uh, not just on the waterfront, but across community district one. Um, because of that, we're seeing higher asthma rates, um, second highest in the city. Um, and uh, just to say that uh, without this legislation, um, there will only be more truck traffic in North Brooklyn and not less. Uh, it's important that we have the, this fair share distributed across the city now, um, or at least in October of uh, 2019. Um, but uh, it needs to go forward now. Um, to reduce the burden on a community that has been dealing with this uh, environmental injustice, not since the closure of Fresh Kills Landfill, but actually much before. Um, those of you who don't know the history of North Brooklyn, it was the economic engine of the United States from the founding to um, uh, up until about World War II. And because of that, there's a lot of environmental uh, degradation. Somebody mentioned the oil spill before. Um, and Communities of color, poor immigrants have been living cheek and jowl with these problems for decades. Um, we need to switch that script, and uh, hopefully this uh, legislation will do a lot to carry that forward. Um, I am concerned about, I'm happy to see Commissioner Garcia in favor of this. I am dubious about her enforcement goals. Um, I don't know who's going out to these waste, waste transfer stations once a week. Um, but they're not doing anything about it. And we need more men in black for the budget uh, that go out. So four is not enough. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And yeah, long before the trash stations were there, we were dealing with uh, incinerators in these communities. Um, so you're right that the trash issue has existed long before Fresh Kills mm -hmm. got shut down. But thank you for your testimony, Eric, and thank you from Community Board One and the work you do in the Transportation Committee. You're a breath of fresh air out there. <laughs> Uh, good morning, or I should say good afternoon. My name is Michael Heimbinder. I serve as board chair at the Newtown Creek Alliance, and I wanted to thank Chair Reynoso and Councilman Levin for inviting testimony today. Uh, the Newtown Creek Alliance is a community-based organization that works to restore, reveal, and revitalize Newtown Creek. For those who aren't familiar, it's the dividing line between North Brooklyn and Western Queens. We're unique in New York City because we advocate for environmental remediation, industrial retention, and community health. Where many might see opposing points of view, we have been able to find common ground. We appreciate the opportunity to bring this point of view to the discussion today. My testimony today will outline, outline our strong support for Intro 157. Neighborhoods surrounding Newtown Creek host a disproportionate number of truck-based waste transfer stations relative to the rest of the city. Collectively, collectively these transfer stations handle almost 40% of the over 12 million tons of waste moving through New York City annually. This is the densest concentration of waste transfer stations in the five boroughs, and this clustering negatively impacts community health and public infrastructure. Since the first modern oil, oil refinery was founded on the creek in 1867, the waterway has served as a conduit to a host of industrial businesses. 
Almost 9 million tons of supplies and product were floated on the creek at the peak of shipping in 1950. Since then, heavy industry has waned, giving way mixed to a mix of wholesale handling and distribution uses. The concentration of truck-based transfer stations, however, is a relatively new occurrence. They represent the more recent era of improvisation that came after in-city disposal options, like landfilling and incineration, were shuttered without a backup plan for export. During this time, the 90s and early aughts, transfer stations popped up in industrial zones like the South Bronx and Newtown Creek, and we've been stuck with this clustering ever since. Even though a more centralized array of waste shed infrastructure makes sense, today's legislation represents a small step back toward a more efficient and equitable strategy for handling solid waste. Today, I'm here to support a piece of legislation that will eliminate unused permit capacity in the city's three most overburdened communities and subsequently ensure that new capacity throughout the city will be handled at marine transfer stations within each borough. Moving essential bulk materials by barge is a best practice that is more efficient economically and environmentally. A single barge has the same capacity as 28 to 56 long haul tractor trailer trucks, depending on the material. Compared to other transportation modes, barge transport of bulk materials is safer in terms of worker injuries and generates far fewer emissions of particulate matter, hydrocarbons, carbon dioxide, CO2, nitrous oxide on a per ton mile moved basis. While today's legislation is a step in the right direction, Newtown Creek Alliance hopes our leaders will take additional steps that will send correct market signals toward the reduction of waste export, job creation and more specialized types of product recovery, and increased reliance on maritime transit. Thanks again for your le leadership and opportunity to speak today. Thank you, thank you for your testimony. And Eric, I don't know what it is, but it seems like you're closing us out often. I need to move you up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna work on that. You're gonna be the first person to speak in the next one. You know, they, they say the first and the last are often the best. Uh, hey. so there you go. So thank close you, Mr. It out. Chairman. Uh, I'm Eric Goldstein from the Natural Resources Defense Council. I'll summarize our written testimony. The city's handle, uh, system for handling commercial waste is completely broken. Intro 157B is a long overdue step in the right direction. It's a modest step forward. It includes many features designed to ensure that sufficient capacity is preserved for both existing waste loads as well as unanticipated increase. The bill's restrictions apply to permitted capacity at these transfer stations, which is far higher than the actual daily tonnage that these facilities receive on an ongoing basis. Of course, there are exceptions for organics handling in calculating the capacity limits. There are exceptions for waste handled by barge or rail. Every legitimate issue has been addressed by you and Council Member Levin and your staff over the many years in which this legislation has matured. But even this modest initiative has been a long time coming. As far back as 1989, New York City officials recognized the burdens of unequal distribution of undesirable projects like waste facilities when they included the fair share provision in the New York City Charter. Fritz Schwartz, who was the Charter Committee Commission Chair, told the City Council, we chose a process remedy, but our goal was a better distributional equity. And despite these fair share goals, equity in terms of distribution of waste transfer stations has never happened. Indeed, the closure of Fresh Kills Landfill in 2001 led to an expansion of land-based transfer stations in already overburdened communities. And then in 2006, New York's official solid waste management plan also promised to remediate this inequity in commercial waste handling. But little has changed. Take a look at the headlines on the cover of my statement. They go back almost 30 years. I particularly like this one. Polls ask feds to cut trash influx in three neighborhoods. That was 17 years ago. It's been 29 years since the adoption of the fair share provision. How long do these three communities, North Brooklyn, Southeast Queens, and the South Bronx, have to wait to be given some modest level of environmental justice? Mm -hmm. Even passage of 157B will only be the first of several needed reforms. Without a complete revamping of the entire system, such as that envisioned by the Sanitation Department's plan for commercial waste zoning, New Yorkers will continue to be plagued by the pr pollution, traffic, pedestrian threats, diminished recycling, poor wages, and working conditions for employees that currently characterize the private carding industry. To break this long-standing logjam, NRDC strongly supports intro 157B. We thank you and we thank Council Member Steve Levin for your determined leadership and spearheading the efforts to get this bill enacted into law. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate your testimony. Um, 
And with that, we conclude this hearing. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>